wash your hands right to contact. We work with dozens of hitters every year in both baseball, fast pitch, and slow pitch. And the number one question they always ask is, we know what a perfect swing looks like, we just don't know how our mechanics are breaking down. That's why we're so excited to bring you this DVD program today because it's the first one that I know of and we've produced seven or eight ourselves and I've watched a lot of others. It's the first one that actually says, here are the swing flaws and here's specific drills on how to emulate the three parts of the pro swing. As rec players, we don't have a monopoly on slumps. Rusty Bumgarner, several years ago at the UAAA World Series, went something like an unbelievable one or two for 18. But being the great hitter he was, he went back to his good game. And a year later at the same tournament, he was the MVP and Rosmondo won the UAAA World Series. But at least it's nice to know that the pros are sometimes sharing in the same misery that we have as recreational players. This is not a home run hitting tape, but it is a power hitting tape. And we're using the rotational mechanics that the pros use. You can get consistent enough with this swing that you'll be able to simply change your focus aiming at the top and the bottom of the ball. Thus, that's changed your swing angle, and you'll be able to hit the top or bottom with up to an 85% consistency. Now, when you go backside and you have that shorter, quicker stroke, you'll get even more consistent, and you'll be able to spray the ball through holes in the outfield. And once you start really aiming at places where there's no fielders, 800 and batting 900 certainly is a reality and something you can do a lot more easily than you think. We're going to lay this video out in three sections today. In the first section, I'm going to simply present it to you like it was a 30-minute lesson. And we're going to use the Telestrator. I've got some great pro models from the young guys like Rusty Bumgarner, Jeff Hall, and Brett Helmer, all the way through those softball legends like Mike Masenko and Don Clatterbaugh. And we're going to show you that their styles are different, but the fundamentals, the three main parts of the swing, are almost identical. And we've broken those into three parts for your analysis, and we've also given you three separate parts you can drill. We've given you a set of drills that let you break down your swing and find out where you fundamentally go wrong. Part two is going to be real exciting. We're going to see alternative ways of using a focus to get the same rotational swing, but just from a little bit different mental aspect. And we're going to have all the top pros talk, and we're going to try to find something unique from each one of them as they talk about training and techniques they use in hitting. In part three, we present the senior game, showing how softball starts after 40. Organizations like the SSUSA have provided well-run, regional, national, and world tournaments, giving seniors opportunities for affordable and highly competitive softball in a variety of exciting travel locations. Tremendous skill levels are evident in the 40s to 60 age groups, and you'll be amazed to see athletes in their 70s, like Jim Crusher Douglas and Dave Pops North, still hitting the ball 350 to 380 feet. It's absolutely amazing to see eight teams in their 80s battling for a world championship and to see groups like the Woodlawn Hitting Club of St. Petersburg, Florida and the Kids and Cubs hosting members in their 80s and 90s. We finish by watching our senior bomb squad in Kent, Washington, trying to hit the edge of the field cafe. It's 30 feet up and 360 feet away. These guys will be swinging hard, both on and off the field. A lot of you guys have been tweaking the swing for years, and sometimes you have a great BP session, but when you get to the pressures of the game, oftentimes that swing seems to disappear. And it's not a minor change that you need in the swing. Usually, to make a small change in mechanics takes a big mental and physical effort. The first 30 minutes or so of this video, I'm going to work out of the hitting pod here and with the telestrator. Start off by showing you the pro models, breaking the swing into three sections, and giving you hopefully the best understanding you've ever had of a rotational based pro swing. First off, you'll videotape your swing. You'll be able to compare which part of the swing you're breaking down compared to the three pro models that we just showed you. Secondly, you'll be able to go to Brett's package of drills that our advisory staff works so hard on perfecting. And you'll be able to grab the drills for that one particular section where you broke down, and you'll be able to work on that, developing muscle memory until you have it down properly. Then you'll be able to re-videotape your swing. You'll be able to see if you're flowing through all the way. And if not, again, it's just a matter of finding which of the three parts of the swing you're breaking down in, and then doing the drills to develop the muscle memory so you can perfect that portion of it. When your first flaw develops early on in the swing, it steamrolls until you have three or four symptoms of it you can see at contact. And you can use the drills that we provide to correct that. 
And that's the best way for correcting something. You can't go through and try to correct three flaws that you see at contact. You have to go back to the cause of the first one. And if you do something right in the swing, everything else will flow naturally and consistently. And that's the way you have to correct things. uniform looks a whole lot better than Johnny McGraw in his combat uniform. They suck! <laughs> As we sit at the Telestrator and start to watch the pro models, the one thing that you should really start to focus on are the hips. And watch how all these pros have excellent hips, and that's really what distinguishes them between the recreational player. They wind their hips, getting the weight on the back leg, then they go ahead and they get a push off of the rear leg into the stride, getting the body momentum going forward, but still keeping all the weight entirely on the back inside of the rear foot. This allows them to keep in a very athletic stance. They hold the wind longer, and when the front foot starts to come down during the timing, it's the rotation of the hips or the unwind that actually plants that front foot, keeps a good body angle back so that we can brace against the front foot, we can thrust our hips open, against it and get a very tight rotation on a stationary axis. And the important thing about being on a stationary axis, and that's where you draw a line from the top of the head through the body, is that the body rotates in one position. If you rotate in one position without movement on the axis, you're going to be the fastest possible. And because we have the big muscles of the legs and the hips and the in the trunk of the body rotating on that fast axis, we can also have more mass. And when you hit something with more mass, you're more apt to break through the inertia of the ball and drive it in the opposite direction with as little slowdown as possible. That's why when all things are equal, a bigger man is going to hit better than a smaller man or woman because they have the mass of the body on a good rotation. But the one thing about a smaller guy is you can rotate your hips perhaps as fast as the pros. And if the faster you can work on the rotation and having a good fluid rotation, the quicker your hips are going to be. And then the only thing that really comes into play is the length of your arms and the amount of, uh, the amount of distance that the bat head is away from the body. Certainly you understand that because the bat head rotates around the body, that the farther away it can be, the more centrifugal force it builds up as it sweeps around like a planet around the sun. Our key technical change in getting you over the hump in this video has been to break down the swing into three parts, which is more accurate than simply saying ba-boom. It's actually now wind in time, getting into the launch position, which you can say is ba, and then the boom, which is of course the explosive rotational unwind. As we break down the first movements of the swing, the wind in time, the grace and the fluid beauty of Rusty Bumgarner's movements exemplify what rotational hitting means to us. Rusty stands tall, relaxed, with the weight of his back leg centered on the inside of the rear foot. His first motion is to wind the hips, and this helps pull the knee back, and you can see the slow tempo of the timing as he views the pitch and determines if it's a strike he wants to attack. His front leg first pushes away from the plate, then sweeps around towards the pitcher in somewhat of a horseshoe. This allows him a fairly large movement that he can speed up or slow down. It's a relaxed, well-paced timing mechanism. The weight is shifted entirely to the inside of his rear foot, and that's a position that will hold the weight as long as possible and thus keeps the hips closed and keep the wind until the last possible moment before the explosion of the unwind. You can see his hands drop some to develop some rhythm, to keep balance, and to help time the following wind of the upper body, which we'll talk about in part two. Notice how during the wind, the entire body drifts forward. It's pushed partly off the inside of the rear foot, and partially by letting gravity pull it forward over the missing front leg. This is key because Rusty can add the momentum of the forward motion to the drive open of the hips, to create a tremendous amount of force. 
but also since the weight will transfer from the rear foot to the front brace leg during the start of the rotation, this forward drift will enhance the ability to transfer the weight and deliver the power buried on the inside of the rear foot. And all of this transferred seamlessly and powerfully to the front leg during the rotational unwind. As the wind ends, you'll be able to see that the back knee turns and points backwards. This shows that he's coiled the hips and is holding that wind as long as possible on that back leg, thus maximizing the power in his following unwind. A group of hitters who do the same technique, but with a little differing style, are Brett Helmer, Don Clatterbaugh, and my son Brett. On first glance, it appears they may be just lifting the foot, stepping and swinging. But if you analyze it closely, you'll see that Helmer too has weight on the inside of the rear foot, and his hands drop to time as he lifts his front leg. It too is a motion where it starts out slow and controlled, but ends more rapidly as he explodes into the rotation of his hips. If you watch for the telltale signs of the back knee aiming towards the rear as the hips wind, you can see while his foot is up in the air, it slows for a moment and you can see the subtle but pronounced wind of the hips. Clata has a more radical body angle back than Helmer, but certainly you can see how he lifts and see how he winds and times the pitch. All the same elements are in place. My son Brett too utilizes the same style of lift, wind, and time. Two hitters that were teammates on their high school state championship baseball team are Jeff Hall and Johnny McCraw. And I'm guessing due to the similar coaching backgrounds and their baseball background, they both have a much quicker and compact wind and time. Again, I suspect due to the baseball background of not wanting to have a slow pre-swing, these same base mechanics, Hall starts out in a lower position of having more of a rear leg squat, but again, the dramatic hip wind with the body drifting forward and the balance of the pre-swing elements mentioned above are present. Once again, I want to mention that the unwind of the hips is a dynamic motion. And if you wish to have a powerful unwind of the hips, well, you'll need a strong wind. It's just the way our muscles work. In basketball, you wouldn't rebound by simply starting in the squat position. No, rather you lower yourself and then explode into the jump. It's dynamic, not static movements that enable us to use the power fully of the hips. So in summary, we use the wind and time to start out relaxed and loose creating some motion that enables us to start forward as we wind our hips and keep the weight on the inside of the rear foot, watching and waiting for a proper pitch. It lets us hold the power until the last possible second. The package of hip drills that we've developed will make this a controlled and powerful motion. Take a moment here in the hitting pod to talk about the launch position or the commitment to swing. And basically, as we've started in our wind in time, when we see a pitch that we identify as one we want to attack, this simply connects the wind with the unwind. And it has two real key elements. And the first is the reaching out of the front foot forward. This winds out the base, enables us to get some body momentum going forward and to use that momentum. Uh, that momentum is also gonna help us transfer the weight from the rear foot to the front foot on the rotation. And you'll find that it's a circular motion. You'll see as we sweep our foot forward that the rotation of the hips is what's going to plant the front foot. We definitely don't want to just land on the front foot because that's going to bring our front shoulder forward and the rotation will be too late. Rather, if we're thinking of a wind and unwind with that center portion of the commitment to swing in the launch position in between to connect the two, we'll wind, stretch our foot forward, our body will carry ourselves a little bit forward with it, and as the foot's just about ready to land, our rotation plants it. That's a real key element. The rotation plants the front foot because that gives us the ability to keep our body angle back. You see, the hips lead not only by opening first, but they also lead by going ahead with the front foot and getting ahead closer to the pitcher than the upper body. This gives us an angle back that we can rotate against. As we land with the rotation, that front leg is going to be a brace foot and we're going to brace against it. It's going to flex a little bit back and we're going to get a really a good rotational drive off our rear hip. And it's important to have that brace foot out because we want to open with our body angle vertical to back. The pitches come in from ASA probably at an angle like this. 
you trip a little bit flatter. When we play on limited high arc, they come almost straight down, it seems like. And basically, we want our hips to match a little more closely that angle that the pitch is coming down. That way, when we adjust our upper body and the swing path angle, whether we're aiming at the top of the ball or the bottom of the ball for top spin or underspin, we'll be able to match up that plane a little bit more closely. You'll notice too that as we're reaching that foot around forward, we're holding the weight on the inside of our rear foot as long as possible. And you'll notice that the leg will actually turn away as we showed you on the wind and time. This signifies that this leg is being held into place the weight and the coil and the wind of the hips is being held as long as possible on the inside of the back foot. We're winding, we're in an opposite direction here, everything is still loaded here. And as this foot is coming down, we start the rotation. The plant of the front foot is really firmly done with the start of the rotation of the hips. And as that's happening, the hands which initially dip down on the wind are coming back, elbow down hands back, it's a natural instinctive position where we're getting ready to hit the ball. And basically what that does is it winds up the upper body with the lower body. And when you get to this point here where you're just starting to plant and your rotation has started, you'll see there's a little bit of separation yet, the hands are still coming back, but basically the upper body and the lower body are wound together and ready to explode together. And as we talked about the tempo before, it's a slow easy tempo that builds up a little bit faster until we explode right at contact. And it's going to be shortly into that swing that we make contact with the ball and release that energy of the bat head into the ball. Now when we talk about that separation between the hips and the upper body, granted you have stomach muscles and back muscles and your left lat muscle, and in order for them to really take the power that your hips are generating on that tight axis, that tight torque, the huge amount of power that we have, they've got to tighten up. The stomach muscle will tighten up first, with the back and with the lat muscle. And eventually, by the time the hips are just starting open, sometimes you'll see on really flexible hitters, the hands still going back as the hips are coming open. You'll see that little bit of separation. They connect together, and that's when the power and the explosion is really delivered as you rotate open. If you can have the hips rotating open as you're still winding that upper body, you've created some separation, you've created a connection, and you're, you're gonna get kind of a slingshot effect of even more power and momentum as you snap through. As we close out this refresher course on how the swing works, shortly we'll rejoin Bogey for the close of part three, the rotation and snap. But understand that it's important to have a full knowledge of these mechanics before we go to Brett's presentation of the drills. With the following overheads and high speed camera shots, you'll have an inside look at mechanics that few really seem to understand. When you learn and implement the drills, you'll be able to confidently fix any portion of the swing that is breaking down. At last, be able to manage and control your swing. Now, let me tell you the good news. You've already done all the hard work in parts one and two. Surprisingly, most of the swing is now on autopilot. It will happen naturally. The hips and upper body will rotate open. The rear shoulder will drive open, powering the strong push and extension of the top arm. This will push and snap the bat head through the ball. As the rotation finishes, the weight will again shift back to the rear foot as we finish naturally, and the force of the swing is spent. This movement only takes a fraction of a second, too fast to analyze if done correctly. That's why most good hitters can't really tell you specifically what they're doing at impact. You don't force a good swing, rather you feel it unfold explosively in a relaxed, loose manner. Let's take a closer look. As the upper body rotates open, forward motion is stopped and the body spins on a tight axis, maximizing speed and reducing error caused by drifting forward. As the lead shoulder opens, the front arm starts to pull the hands forward and in an arc. You can see from the overheads that the hips lead the hands and the hands lead the bat head. Although it feels like your hands attack the ball, A to B on a straight line forward. That's just your focus. In reality, the body is opening its first 90 degrees of a tight rotation, and the hands and bat head will drive forward as you extend. But they will also follow the rotation of the body in a shallow arc. The first 90 degrees of the rotation is forward and in an arc toward the ball, since it happens quickly. It's important to see how the bat head must make contact rather early in this rotation 
as the bat head snaps from lag back to contact. We want to be able to hit the ball squarely with the bat head. Too much angle early or late will cost us power and consistency. The point of contact with the ball, depending on the pitch location, will be even with or slightly ahead of the front of the body. It's key to let the ball come back to you and allow the rotation to bring the bat head to the ball. If we are too early and chase forward, we will drift out of our tight axis of rotation. A breakdown of the swing begins. Shortly after we feel our lead arm starting to pull the hands, we will need to trigger the swing. We do so by pushing and extending our top arm as explosively as we can, aiming at the part of the ball we wish to attack. This action will push and snap the bat head from lag back to impact with the ball. The lead wrist will hinge, becoming a pivot point. This creates a second pendulum of rotation. Since the lead arm is continuing to be pulled forward and away in an arc, it's absolutely key for the extension and push of the top arm to be done as quickly as humanly possible. This is why this becomes our main focus in part three, trying to catch up and deliver a powerful snap to impact. I want to tie up the end of part three by going quickly over some very important points. When you get to the last part of the swing, this rotate and snap, you're going to find that that happens in just a fraction of a second. And all you have time for is really one thing to focus on. Uh, when you come down with the front foot and the rotation starts, we found through our research that the best thing you can do is to push and extend the top arm. And we find that it's easier to aim and push and extend the bat head with the top arm. Very early in the swing, your lead arm is going to go from here to about even with home plate. And once it reaches this point here, it's going to rotate away. And as it rotates away, of course, automatically being pulled by the rotation of the lead shoulder, as it rotates away, watch how it pulls the bat forward. That's going to enhance your ability to push and snap at that point in time. But again, watch how early in the swing this comes. Bingo, we're right there already. And I can't emphasize that as soon as we get in the launch position, you have to aim and push immediately because you don't have time to think, well, I'm going to guide here first and then I'm going to push and extend. You have lost a swing. It's got to happen very early in the swing. You'll find it sometimes confusing to listen to what the pros say. It's because they're such nat natural athletes. They don't have to think about this. This stuff comes to them naturally and their hips are so explosive that they automatically drive the rear shoulder and the top hand forward. I can show you by putting my hand real loose on my hips. If I turn real slow, that hand wants to stay there. But if I wind it time and explode, you can see I didn't make any effort to move my hand, but it got out to here because the shoulder thrust so explosively that the hand automatically wanted to extend. So that's why it's confusing to listen to Jeff Hall in our Blasting Bombs video say, well, the top hand's along for the ride. Well, as we went through our research, I called Jeff this past winter and I said, Jeff, you know, my research and our staff's research is finding that the rear hip, the rear shoulder, and the top arm extend and really push snap through. And I said, that's what it looks like in your swing to me. I don't think that's happening automatically. And he thought for a minute, he says, hey, cuz, that's exactly what I'm doing. So even though Jeff's focus is on getting his lead arm out, he probably wants to get extended better by making sure the lead arm is out and guided. His hips are so explosive that he can automatically rely on them to push and extend through. It's very easy to aim at the top or bottom of the ball. And people say, well, that's a pretty accurate stroke, isn't it? If you think about it in those terms, yes, but what you're really doing is changing your swing angle. And when you get into that launch position and you start to aim and push and extend, if I aim at the bottom of the ball that's, say, chest high, my swing angle is going to be pretty much parallel to the ground, okay? So that's a zero angle. If I aim at the top of the ball and try to hit top spin, I'm going to push to here. And you can see the swing angle is going to change maybe this much. That's probably 30 degrees off of what a level swing is aiming at the bottom. So can you change your swing angle 30 degrees? Absolutely. That's not very hard to do. To properly understand over snap, I want to show you that there's a plane that continues from the top of the forearm and the hand out in a straight line. And when we swing with good over snap, when this wrist turns properly, you'll be able to see that on contact, we're over the top of that plane. 
plane runs down to here and we've come over the top of it. Again from the rear, as we snap, we're over the top of it. That shows you that this wrist is turned properly, it's hinged properly, and has allowed us to go from lag back to contact and through it with the extension of the top arm. If we just flex sideways, if we just flex this wrist sideways, again, watch, here's my full extension. I've only gone this far. My top arm is fully extended, I've only gone this far. From the rear, I've only gone this far, that's under snap. It's an improper flex or hinge of the lead wrist. But if I turn that wrist this way, and still I'll be in the palm down, palm up position of better strength and rebound to the ball hitting the bat. But look how much more distance I travel. And again, you can see the bat head is above the plane. Again, from the rear, under snap, I'll take a full extension of my top arm. That's all the farther the bat head goes. But if I let this wrist rotate and allow the over snap, I'm over the top of that plane. That's why it's so important to understand how over snap works and how the key to the hinging portion of the wrist is to allow it to rotate and over snap rather than just to flex sideways. If you're serious about improving your hitting, then you need to understand the swing mechanics and how they can be broken down into drillable parts, which is what we just presented to you. It's surprising that in softball, very few players actually do drills. And so in order to get that new proper muscle memory or to correct flawed muscle memory, you need to be able to do a basic short function drills that will improve your swing. New skills are learned by doing short duration but consistent drilling. Each one of these drills focuses on an individual part of the total swing, but then we gradually move on and combine them together so that we understand the flow and tempo when we bring it all into one part. You don't need much to get started, just the bare essential equipment, a bat, a couple of tees, and some balls. But the first set of drills that we're presenting to you require no equipment, and they're designed to be used on a daily basis, and you can do them pretty much anywhere. Many of the items we're using today is stuff that we invented or that you can make yourself. And we'll give low cost options for many of the items we use in the cage. I'll be presenting this program at the Truman Center, our state of the art facility right here in Truman, Wisconsin, where we do all our research and teaching. As you learned, the hips are essential. So the first drill that we're gonna do is called the wind in time. And it's gonna help wind your hips before you start to explode them. Whether you're at work, school, or simply watching TV at home, you can do these drills without a bat by clenching your fists, bringing them tight to your hip points, and tying your upper body and lower body together. So that when you wind in time, and then later in the swing when your lower body explodes open, your upper body will follow in the same motion. You get a feeling that the hips are what's leading the swing. So you get into a good stance, get your weight on the inside of the back foot, and then you wind the hips, wind, and then you'll feel as you come forward Gravity will pull you down, and pushing off the back, inside of your back foot will push you a little bit forward. Wind. As you wind the hips, your front foot has to come back quickly to catch you from falling forward. Wind. Wind. A really good way to monitor that if you're not coming forward too much and falling onto that front foot and that you're keeping a good body angle is by using a mirror with this drill to make sure that you're staying wind back in this good position. This helps develop flexibility of the hips, balance of getting the weight on the inside of your back foot, and also the timing of doing the wind. We're gonna progress on to using the wind in time, flowing into getting into the launch position. So as we wind, you'll notice that as we come forward with gravity and pushing off the inside of the back leg, that when we rotate and open our hips, that's what's gonna plant the front foot. So as we wind and come down into our motion, our hips are starting to open up, we're getting into that uh, launch position, our front foot is planting, our back heel is up in the air, our front foot is vertical, and our upper body angle is back. We can really easily lose the proper body angle by coming forward on that front foot. So we're gonna start really slowly with these drills and just get the wind, and as we come forward, slowly open up our hips, which plants our front foot, and prevents us from coming over top and lunging. It keeps us back in a good body angle of attack, and as we open the hips, we're in a good body position. Again, do this drill slowly, and you can monitor your position by looking into the mirror. One. 
Don't think of your front foot as a long straight ahead. Think of it more as an extension or extending your base so that you have that base in front of you for you to rotate against. Now we're going to combine the wind in time with the launch position and then the rotation and snap. And we like the term ba-boom, we used it in the last video, where the ba correlates to the launch position. The term boom perfectly describes this explosive aspect of the swing. So let's put them all together. Wine ba boom Wine ba boom This drill is really awesome because we can do a full speed without resistance of hitting a ball. We can start with a slow tempo with the wind and time get into the launch position and then explode as we rotate and over snap through the ball. And we can do this in full speed with this, with this drill all together, which is what's great, keeping us in a great body position and allowing us to open the hips and keeping our upper body and lower body tied together as we go up through and explode. The hips are definitely the power plant of the swing. So you need to understand how to use them correctly before you can move on to more advanced parts of the swing. That's why this wind in time, ba-boom, hip drill is the foundation to a great swing and you have to perfect it before you can move on. Once you get this drill perfected, you can skip the other two drills on a daily basis and you can just do the, the wind in time, ba-boom, hip drill all at once. This drill doesn't require any equipment, so it's designed that you can do it two to three times a day, like three sets of ten, and you can do it at work, school, or at home. We also encourage you to do a few sets of the drill uh, the opposite way, mainly if you're left-handed, do it right-handed, or if you're right-handed, do it left-handed. This helps develop harmony and symmetry in training the muscles for this exercise. Another one of the drills that we can do without using any equipment or without using a bat is the wind and time ba-boom hip drill, uh, but focusing on the lead arm part of the swing. So we start with our lead arm back, and as we open up our hips, our upper body starts to follow, and it's in a nice tight rotation. And the important part is that very early in the swing, in our lead arm, our front forearm uh, rotates over, and that allows our front wrist to hinge over, and that creates the over snap. And you want to create that very early in the swing. So as you rotate through, it snaps the bat head over. Again, with this drill, you can take a full swing without the resistance of hitting a ball. Wind, ba boom! Wind, ba boom! It's important that as soon as we feel our lead arm being pulled around by our upper body opening, that we start rotating the front forearm, which allows our wrist to hinge over, allowing for the over snap. So go ahead and do these drills full speed and realize that it's important that when your upper body opens, your lead wrist comes through, hinges over, allowing that over snap. Wind, ba boom! Wind, ba boom! As we do our top hand drill and we wind and we start to unwind, we feel the back shoulder and the back hip start to push our top hand forward. And as it starts to push, you get to this point here and that's where we hammer snap our top hand and our, extend our top arm over the top so that we get that good over snap and that's what powers it through. Wind, ba -boom. Notice how my hand comes down and then draws back all the way as I get through the drill, and that gets me into a good position to give the most powerful blow into the oversnap. Next, we had our first tool, which is the bat, and we're going to do the wind in time, ba boom, hip drill, where we're going to use the bat across our waist. And this is going to give us the feeling of when our hips open and explode, that the rear hip is driving the bat head forward into the ball. And also, it lets us uh, take the proper angle of attack so that when we open up, we can visualize the bat head going at the proper angle at wherever we want to hit the ball. Now, there's going to be adjustments to the swing itself, but we always want to get in that position to where we're driving the bat head at an up angle so that we don't come forward and lunge, that it prevents us from doing that, and that we also keep our upper body at the proper angle. This enables us to rotate tightly and powerfully against the front brace leg. Aside from the bat on the hip drill, now that we've added a bat to our drills, we don't want to take a full swing unless we're actually hitting a ball or hitting some kind of resistance object. The reason for that is, first of all, we want to understand that there's a point of contact earlier in the swing. It's not way out here, it's back in the swing. We want to have a concrete point of contact, something to strike that's right here back earlier in our swing. And secondly, we don't want to take a full swing without resistance 
because as we come through without getting any kind of resistance, like hitting a ball or another resistance object, we unnaturally have to slow down our swing at the end, and that messes up our entire swing mechanics. Understand that when you hit an object with a full swing, you transfer the energy from the bat head into that object, and then you finish with a nice, relaxed, smooth, mo smooth motion. So to do the wind in time, ba boom, hip drill, uh, with the bat, we just do it simply the same as before, except we grab our fists like this around the bat, we put it right tight to our hip points, tying the upper body and lower body together, and we just do it like we did before. Wind, boom. Wind, ba boom. Wind, ba boom. This drill is great because it's one of the few ones that you can do full speed without the resistance of hitting something. And notice the tempo of the swing. The wind and time is slow, wind, and as we move into the buff and the boom, we get up to 100% and that's where the real rotational power comes into play. Wind, but boom! You can monitor that you've done this correctly by taking the bat, putting it on the top of your ankle, and it should be straight coming up to your hip, which means that you haven't come forward over the front brace leg and you're in the proper body angle, all the way up to the top. One of the best tools that we can use is the batting tee, and that allows us to practice by ourselves. We can either hit outside into an open field, or we can use it inside and hit into a net. Any of the drills that we did without equipment previously, we can do with a bat off the tee now, such as the lead arm swing drill, the top hand swing drill, and we can also use it to hit backside, and also use it to hit the top of the ball to get top spin, and also the bottom of the ball to get bottom spin. The T allows us to use the tempo of slow with the wind and time and get faster into the explosion of the boom part of the swing. The only thing it doesn't give us is the actual timing aspect of live pitching. You want to get that feeling that the rotation of the hips is bringing the bat head around into the ball, not a lunging motion or a reaching out at the ball, but your hips winding and unwinding with the proper body angle is what's bringing your bat head with all that power and bat speed through the ball. We focused on the lead arm and also the top hand earlier without the bat. Now we can easily transition into hitting it off a tee using the bat and still focusing on either the lead arm swing drill or the top hand swing drill. Wind. Now the top hand swing drill. Wind. Understanding that the top arm along with the top hand deliver a lot of the power of the oversnap along with being a guide to give us the proper angle into the ball, we can do, use the top hand swing drill to hit either the top half or the bottom half of the ball creating that top spin or underspin, whichever we desire. I'll go underspin. Wind. Now top spin. Wind. Do three sets of five of each, the lead arm swing drill and also the top hand swing drill, then put it all together and allow that top arm and top hand to guide the proper angle of the swing and also to deliver that blow of the over snap. Wind. You really want to have one focus off the tee once you bring the swing all together. Your main focus is to push and extend as fast as you can the top arm and the top hand right through the part of the ball that you want to attack. Wind. I'm going to move up in the box and do a top spin backside. Wind. Underspin. Wind. You've all seen Barry Bonds take the very same swing on a low knee high to thigh high pitch as he does on a waist high to chest high pitch and still hit the ball out of the park. That's because he still winds and times get to this point here and instead of staying more vertical and over snapping at a pitch that's chest high, we want to use what uh, the term that we're using is tilt in which we tilt our upper body changing the plane of attack to where we can still over snap up through the ball no matter if the pitch is waist high or even down to knee high. So when I get to this point here, I see the pitch is knee high or waist high, I tilt myself and that still allows me to over snap into the ball and I can still hit a rising fly ball. Now I'm gonna tilt. One, two. Pitch which is lower out of my zone, but I can still get good power on it because of the tilt. 
One. Just like on a chest high pitch, we want our swing angle to be level to slightly up when we over snap into the ball. So when I get a lower pitch like this, I still want to use the same mechanics. I'm just using the tilt of my upper body to change the swing plan. One. Now from this angle, watch how vertical my body is on a chest high pitch as I unwind and over snap. I'm right here. Now if I want to hit a pitch that's any lower than that, the only way that I can do that is by tilting my upper body. So I get to this point here, I see the pitch is waist high or lower, in this case knee high. I tilt my upper body and then I still over snap at a level or slightly up angle through the ball and I can still get good power. The great part about soft toss is that all you need is a hanging net and a partner and unlike hitting off of a tee, it adds that timing aspect into the drill which you can use your wind in time and practice that. When doing this drill, we want to keep our body angle back as well as when our hips open, we want to make contact with the ball and drive it up into the net. This drill really promotes good hip rotation as well as setting a good body angle and angle with your hips to get up through the ball. One thing about this drill is that there's not a lot of room for adjustment with your swing. So you got to make sure that the pitcher gets the ball right there at that hip level so you can make good contact with the bat head. This drill adds a timing aspect that hitting off a tee doesn't and it also gives you the feeling that you can wind in time and then your hips are exploding and actually exploding the bat head into the ball. And the important part is that there's not a lot of adjustment that you can do in the swing so it's important that your partner lays the pitch in there right at that waist high level so that you can make good contact every time. Our hips rotate open and drive at an up angle, therefore we should be able to hit the ball and drive, that, and drive it up at the same angle our hips open. This is one of the harder drills to do, but it really helps you work on your timing and also your explosion and rotating open of the hips. We can add the element of timing which hitting off the tee doesn't have by using soft toss and using our lead arm swing drill. my forearm early, the wrist will hinge properly and that will bring my bat head around into the over snap. Once again, what I like about soft toss is that it gives you that timing element that you don't get when you're practicing off the tee. This is really a great drill because it ties your top hand, your rear shoulder and your rear hip together as you push and extend the top hand and explode through the ball. You can really feel the tying of everything together and the force of the rear hip driving the bat head. It's really important for your pitcher to give you practice hitting all kinds of different types of pitches, so a low pitch, outside, inside, or a high pitch. And you can also use that as an opportunity to aim for the lower half as well as the top half of the ball. I'm going to try and hit the top of the ball to get top spin on it. Now I'm going to hit a ball with underspin. You can see that using the top hand as a push and as a guide that it can be very accurate. Now I join the lead arm and the top arm together and I take my normal swing using soft toss. Now I'm going to ask my pitching partner for some waist high pitches so I can hit some balls with top spin and keep them down. is that you can go from hitting top spin to underspin with great accuracy. All because of the great tie-in that your rear hip, rear shoulder, and top arm have. Top arm swing drill. Now I'm either going to yell out top spin or underspin. Top spin. some lower pitches as well as the high pitches. Thank you, Brett. 
The drills will be listed on the inside cover of this DVD so you can easily reference them and build your program. It's imperative that you set up a daily drill program so you not only build good muscle memory, but work on strengthening and building flexibility on these muscles. Success comes from doing the drills more frequently and of shorter duration, say three sets of five to 10. Just get in the habit of doing them throughout the day and getting a feel for the motions. Use them as a warm up for all sports activity. Building the crucial muscle memory is a slow process, but will be the key to your long-term success. Remember to do a small percentage of the same drills from the opposite side. Setting up this program is the difference between wanting to excel and willing yourself to excel. To finish this section, we're going to introduce specialized swing drills and supplemental equipment that will enhance the drills and help you correct specific stubborn swing flaws that need isolated attention. We introduce some clever equipment that we have invented and you can easily make yourself. From a legal standpoint, these have not been safety tested. So use caution on anything you may try to manufacture. You're doing so at your own risk, and so use discretion. When doing the daily drills without tools, we lose the feeling of resistance. That comes from the weight of the bat. So to give a more realistic feel, we simply took a bat handle, cut it off, drilled a hole through the knob, added a rope and bungee cords. Thus the birth of a bungee bat. We added enough long bungee cords for a full range of motion and taped the hooks so they stay connected. You can see how Destiny does her daily drills more effectively using a measure of resistance. The bungees allow full motion and help keep you from lunging, giving a more realistic feel when doing the bat on the hip, lead arm, top arm, and the full swing drill. Simply move ahead or back to get the best feel of resistance and motion. Throw this in the bat bag, car, or office to enhance a good drill session and to use as an on-deck warm-up. We have always liked the guide rope, this has been used in our other videos and is easy to make. Simply cut a piece of heavy rope and add bungee cords on each end. This promotes good extension and a straight line bat head path following the arc of the swing, thus keeping the bat head from dipping. Add a tee and put the ball at the rope level. And for pitches waist high and below, it helps cut down a looping golf swing and develops a good bat path to extension. Set anchors so the guide rope can be used at knee, waist, and chest levels. On higher pitches, you may have to swing under the rope. Also, the guide rope is an excellent tool for setting up an angle for the bat on the hip drill. One of Bogey's favorites is the slide tube. When we cut a short piece of PVC pipe and smooth the ends and add this to our guide rope, we now have a tool we call the slide tube. Add an extra bungee cord to the end and make the rope longer so you have room to adjust the length. This enhances the daily drills by giving resistance and providing a great simulation of the actual swing mechanics. It provides a tremendously satisfying feeling of the hip snapping open and the strong extension and oversnap. Visualize and snap the bat head to impact with the ball. Thus, a concrete point of contact is established and ingrained. You can change the height of the slide tube rope and visualize hitting thigh, waist, or chest high pitches. And you can move your point of contact so you can hit outside or inside pitches to change the plan of attack. With some mental visualization, this is a great tool. If you don't have a hitting stick, this is probably the next best thing you can do before a game because it really gives you the good feel of what you're actually doing in your swing and it gives you a little bit of resistance so you can feel your hips opening up and you can feel that over snap as you come through to the point of contact. A product we sell off our website for $25 is the Zip and Hit Pro. This is a great product, which is designed to be used for fast pitch and baseball live BP simulation. We simply anchor the end securely and use it to do all the basic drills. It provides resistance and allows us to take full swings with resistance when a T is not an option. It works all the base drills quite nicely, combining resistance with a guide rope, allowing swings with a normal bat. The Pro Handheld Hitting Stick is a great way to warm up on the field before games. It gives you the ability to hit something solid, finding your good point of contact, and simply warming up those sore shoulder and back muscles. This is available through our website as well. It's portable and can be carried in a bat bag. The Mule Bag is one of the most economical, durable, and versatile pieces of equipment we use. It allows you to work on the concrete point of impact with an object that allows a full swing. One of the greatest pieces of equipment in developing a great point of contact is the Mule Bag by Mule Tech. 
We want to adjust the position of the bag so that it's in the proper point of attack. So understand that on a chest high pitch, we want to move our stance up so that when we're opening up at the point of contact, it's farther back in our swing so that we don't reach out for it or so that we don't get jammed back. We want it to be right at that proper point of contact. We want to concentrate on hitting into the ball and breaking it like it's made of glass. So therefore we want to maximize all of our power at the point of contact and just allowing our follow through to happen naturally. This can be mounted on a fence or vehicle hitch for pre-game warm-up and strength conditioning. It's a clever design and an awesome piece of training equipment from Mule Tech. Mule Tech has such an assortment of training devices, it's well worth a look on their website. We really like the combination of the Mule Power Balls and Brush Top Tee. The unique brush top is durable and easily holds the one pound 20 inch poly balls. Since they're smaller than a volleyball or basketball, they must be struck more precisely, and the principles of hitting the middle top and middle to bottom are easily understood through the feedback they provide. Resistance and strength training are maximized as the hitter is forced to use the hips and lower body as efficiently as possible to minimize the slowdown of the bat head through impact. We find them fun to hit with a very satisfying feeling of a good blast of the ball. Bob and the gang at evilsports.com have really come out with a great BP ball to complement their entire line of high quality softballs. The Evil BP Ball is designed to give you thousands of game quality BP swings without damaging your composite bats. The two color cover allows you to hone your hitting skills even more by being able to monitor ball spin. Pitchers can also benefit by using this ball to practice knuckle balls and different types of spin because of the spin monitoring ability. The ball has very good performance and is awesome to hit. Kevin will explain how the ball works. Well, a good thing for identifying flaws in your swing is Evil Ball makes this batting practice ball, which is uh, half orange and half white. And the reason that this ball is so good is you can actually watch the rotation of the ball after it's left the bat. So it's easy to correct the way you're swinging. If you're hitting the ball late, the ball's going to spin to the right and tail or to the left if you're a lefty, and you can watch the sideways ball rotation. If you get out in front early, it's going to do the opposite where it's going to spin the opposite direction. To optimize your, your distance, you want to spin the ball backwards. So when you hit the ball just below the center line, you watch the ball come off the bat spinning with backspin. You know you've hit the ball at the right part of the plate, the right part of the bat, and got the proper backspin to increase your distance. This is a very good ball to practice with because you can pick up the rotation very easy. Back in the cage, let's demonstrate some specialized drills that will help on specific swing flaws. The brace leg drill is awesome for soft toss, and it helps those who lunge. Lunging can be defined by saying the front shoulder and upper body travel forward, breaking the back body angle and making a tight rotation impossible. Simply put out the brace leg and feel a strong rotational drive against it while pushing and extending the top arm. This can be done off of a tee or very effectively off soft toss. Use the short burst of the hips to drive the top arm push and extension into the oversnap, keeping the rotation and driving the ball up, aiming at the specific part of the ball you wish to attack. For the pipe drill, we take a four foot piece of heavy grade PVC pipe, and while we are using a rubber cage ball, for safety reasons, we would promote only the use of light plastic wiffle balls. Again, for liability reasons on all of these tools, use only at your own discretion and risk. Bogey thought he tried the pipe drill outside with regular softballs, and the results were disastrous. I caught that on the sweet spot. I guess this won't work for a live performance of 35 degrees. Jeez. So use light plastic wiffle balls with a four foot pipe that can withstand the forces of your swing. The principal goal here is to magnify any error that you have in your swing by extending the bat length. If you're golfing or under snapping, it shows up more clearly as the flaw is magnified at the end of a four foot pipe. Your rotation, push, extension, and point of contact are critically stressed and this drill promotes the use of good form with instant feedback of hitting the plastic balls. Many coaches advocate throwing the bat into a field or safety net. This really promotes a good brace leg, proper hip angle, and the feeling of the hips leading the swing in a tight and explosive rotation. The hips should open up at an angle against the front brace leg, so simply push and extend the top arm and release the bat at the same up angle. 
Use a bat that won't be hurt by this abuse. And, of course, take all safety precautions as you do this drill. Watch out for bat rebound, and in open areas, keep clear of objects you may damage. The bat on the chest drill can help you learn to adjust the tilt by hitting balls off the tee. Keep the good body angle back, but adjust the tilt to drive the bat head through lower pitches. Always try to drive the ball at an up angle. The 1-2-3 oversnap drill helps us understand that the hips and upper body open first, setting a proper back angle for tight rotation. And it helps our hips pop a quick and powerful oversnap at a slight up angle to better match the arc of the pitch. Stay loose and relaxed. Rotate forward and back on a 1-2 count. As you go back for the third time, trigger an explosive hip burst, aiming at the correct angle and pushing and extending the top arm to oversnap the bat head through the ball. You can practice hitting the middle, top, or bottom of the ball, as well as hitting backside. This promotes the second pendulum of bat speed and helps you trigger the oversnap early in the swing. Make sure you feel that explosive snap to impact. To promote better extension, develop hand-to-eye coordination, and to help increase the speed of the hips and top arm push and extension, back toss is a great drill. It forces the hitter to rotate faster and extend even quicker to catch up with the ball. Relaxed body rotation and speed are always key in the swing. Use of power balls add a dimension of resistance training. Both the lead arm and top arm swing drill can be combined with soft toss and a racket ball or tennis racket to help promote the lead wrist hinge and top arm extension. Sometimes alternate equipment using the same drills triggers a better understanding and natural development of swing mechanics. We first heard of this drill from Brian Wegman and it involves working on taking the hips beyond the normal range of rotating open. This improves speed, flexibility, and it promotes the feeling of the hips leading the upper body and swing. Having a strong brace leg is necessary to do this properly without lunging past the front leg. So we're here on the field for our final progression, which is live BP. We've gone through all the daily drills, we've gone through the T work, the soft toss, and now we're finally up to live pitching. You'll hear guys say, I just get up there and grip and rip it, and that's right. But before that, you have to build up the technique and the muscle memory so that when you get up there, you can only think about one focus, and that's gripping and ripping the ball. You already have the main base of your swing done with the drills before you step into the, into the box. And then when you get up there, you have that one focus of getting your pitch, extending and pushing that top arm right into the ball. The main things to get out of the live BP is, first of all, timing hitting a live pitch as, is a lot different than hitting off of a tee or off soft toss. And then also getting comfortable with hitting to all fields with all different types of spin and uh, hitting the top half and the bottom half of the ball when it's actually coming into you as, as a live pitch. And lastly, being able to place the ball where you want it by pushing and extending that top hand and aiming it at either the top half, the bottom half, or the middle of the ball, depending on where you want to put it. When you're in a game situation and you want to get your best combination of average and power, aim for the middle of the ball, right in the center of the ball, and then if you're off a little bit on top, you're, gonna, you're still going to hit a line drive with top spin, and if you're off a little bit on the bottom, you're going to hit a rising line drive or a home run type ball. The disadvantage to aiming for the bottom half of the ball when the home runs are open every time is that maybe one out of three or one out of every four times you're going to get too much of the under of the ball and you're going to pop it up. Uh, and if the home runs are open and you're hitting a lot of pop-ups, that's unacceptable. Too many guys are batting practice heroes. They hit great in BP. And you'll find that just like in the hitting, there's a progression. You get good at the drills. You get good at soft toss. You get good off a tee. You progress so that you're good in BP. And finally, the game situations are different. And what happens to guys in the game sometimes is they get distracted by the focus of the crowd, the pressures of the game. And what you have to do sometimes is visualize things like Brett pitching to you. Have your BP partner be the focus you have at the plate and pretend that the pitch is your BP partner and you're just taking BP. But one thing great that Brett said about BP is you want to make sure that you use a good pitch selection and understand that your point of contact is back farther on. So just like the Steels did in the early 80s when they barnstormed, they'd always take five or six pitches backside. And that allowed them to stay back, let the ball come back so they didn't lunge, and they could hit it further back in the swing. You're always better to be farther back in the swing than lunging the way out ahead because the first half of your swing, the bat generally comes up to the ball. But on the second, and your wrists are in a stronger position, in a palm down and palm up, 
There has been some turn at the start of the over snap, but generally speaking, you're still in a palm down, palm up, even though they're angled a bit. But the second half of the swing, rapidly the swing goes down lots of times as it finishes out, and the wrists become extended out. So rather than having a straight shot from the hands all the way through the arms to the chest and the forearms and to the shoulders, if you're way out here, the wrist has some flexion in it, and they can cause some trouble. So certainly, the being, it being in a weaker position, so certainly you want to make sure you catch on the first half of the swing where your body's still rotating and you have all that power of the hips and the weight behind you. Now when we start out, we want to do the five swings backside simply to get that focal point of hitting backside, letting the ball come back to you, getting the good point of contact. One of the most important things in BP is getting your pitch and not chasing pitches out of the zone. And if you want to go backside, you can either back away from the plate a little bit or you can stay in your normal stance and just let the pitch get back into you more or look for a more outside pitch where it's easier to go that way. And during a game, I don't have a lot of finesse to go that way, but if I see they have a spot open for me or a gap open where I can take advantage of it, I'll either shift my feet a little bit or I'll just wait for an outside pitch or a pitch to get back into me a little bit more and I'll use my same mechanics but just drive it to the opposite field. Step back away from the plate a little bit so that any ball that's right down the middle is going to be a little bit outside to me and any ball that's initially outside is going to be right in the zone for me to go backside. And I don't care if the other team sees that and maybe adjusts to it, I can still pull the ball or go up the middle. On the other side of things, if I want to pull the ball, if I have a home run to use up, or if there's a wind blowing out to right and there's a few guys on base, I'll crowd the plate a little bit more because I like to pull a, an inside pitch or a pitch over the middle is going to be a little bit more inside to me. So I'll get a little bit closer to the plate so I can get a pitch that I can hit with some more power and to the power alley. That's as absolutely good as I hit a ball. Sitting with all the weight on the back foot, a little wind, and then just letting it come back to about right here. It feels like it's on a tee right here, and just pushing it extend right to there. I'm going to try to put some top spin on it now. Aim at the top of the ball. Nice line drive through the 5-6 hole over the top into the outfield. of the swing, you're so consistent. I say 85% of the time, if you get a good pitch selection, waist high and lower, you're going to be able to get top spin on it. I think the number one thing that I've realized being down here for four days with uh, Bogey and, and Brett is the fact of the value of the videotaping. Uh, I've done some videotaping in the past, but I've really learned a lot about what you're looking for in the videotapes. And, and as Bogey says, videotapes don't lie. So. It really is a very educational process and, and looking at this and understanding about your swing and really learning about your swing. And a lot of times as players, and, and we get into the habit of just swinging and we don't really analyze what we're doing or how we're doing it. And that's when we get in trouble, we get in a little bit of a slump. Then we have difficulty coming back out of that because we don't know where to correct the issues that are not going correctly. Uh, and what I've found here is to simplify it, but also have the checkpoints where I can go back and make sure that uh, such things as making sure I get my hands back far enough and my snapping and my hip, getting my hips into it. What am I doing wrong that I can correct my swing with? So, Part of what I would do, is I may swing a bat, but I didn't really do very many drills to kind of oh, focus in on one of the three steps. The more you're working at this, the more you need to be analyzing it and understanding what you're doing because you can constantly learn and improve. And what I'd recommend for all the rec players out there is to go back, keep it simple, Get your basics, follow the basics, uh, look at this video. I think you're going to pick up a lot of things that are very great clues as to well, how you become a very good hitter. Understanding that positive practice brings good mechanics. Some flaws are so stubborn that they need isolated attention. And flaws basically fall into three groups. We see this when the front shoulder and the upper body chase forward and down. It breaks that straight line back body angle, and the results are slower rotation, less bat speed, a loss of hip drive at impact, and a poor point of contact. A downswing and resulting cleave of the ball is quite common. Probably the number one flaw we see is lunging. Here the second pendulum, or the second level of bat speed, are very weak. 
the front side and the lead arm basically drag the bat head forward in an arc. There's very little rear hip drive and the top arm extension is almost minimal. Besides a weak oversnap, the aim is also affected. And since the bat head, of course, does not rise them up at impact, the bat cleaves under the ball too radically. Uh, we see this as a common phenomena as senior hitters age and for those who have leg or hip injuries. If you focus on the front side pull and the hips are not automatically pushing the rear side explosively open, bat snap can be weak. Some hitters are jammed back with no weight transfer. And these hitters never land on the front foot and transfer the weight during the rotation. Thus, they're jammed back on impact. And you can see the hips open more slowly and the bat path is also shortened. And overall, the mechanics basically fail because we're jammed on the rear foot and don't get that good weight transfer and thus a good hip rotation. Using video, compare your batting practice swings to game at bats. You hit well in BP, but if you do poorly in games, check these points. First, review your pitch selection and make sure you're swinging at the good strikes that suit your hitting needs. Secondly, game nervousness and tension can make your muscles tighter. So our pre-swing becomes shorter, more tense. Thus, the timing that we practice is altered and our hitting mechanics suffer. Loose and relaxed muscles are gonna work a lot more effectively and through a larger range of motion. So you'll find that deep breathing on deck helps us relax. So make this a habit in BP and then in games as you step into the box. You wanna make sure you keep your weight on the back of leg while you time the pitch. Don't start the timing on the step forward. You actually wanna stay back as long as you possibly can on that rear foot because the step forward and the swing are gonna come fast. The winding time is easy, but the planning of the front foot and the swing is a dynamic motion explosively forward. So keep separate that second part from the timing and keep the weight on the rear leg as long as possible. It helps to understand that a swing's rhythm connects all the different physical parts of hitting into one motion. We do our drills to learn these techniques and sequence of techniques, developing a memory in our muscles. Then we work on the speed or the tempo of the swing rhythm, doing it correctly, faster and faster, until all the small parts become one explosive fluid motion. Ba boom. Too many hitters try to slow this explosive motion down so they feel they can analyze it while swinging and control each motion. It can't be done. In order to be explosive, this has to be done too fast to analyze. When you've drilled it enough, you'll trust that the mechanics are right and you can focus on the aim and the explosion of the swing. On the pre-swing, since it's a slower paced motion, it should feel significant because you're much more aware of feeling the movement over a long period of time. So it's perfect for analyzing the pitch as you sit back and you wind in time. But conversely, as you progress to the ba-boom, bang, it's over. We should have covered a lot of ground in such a short period of time that the ba-boom should mentally feel smaller and quicker. So mentally control the pre-swing and instinctively react on the swing itself. For some, it'll be more logical to use realistic terms. You can replace the wind with wait as you wind in time, and then also replace the ba-boom by saying a quick step swing. In essence, this is what you're doing. Wait, step swing. You understand from the previous sections that the power comes from our rear side, rear shoulder, top hand thrust. But because everybody thinks a little bit different logically, it only makes sense that there's different focuses that hitters use to trigger the same natural power rotational swing. So let's take a look at four common focuses that we've identified. Now, Brett Helmer and Larry Carter are two top pros, and they focus on using the hip rotation to pull the lead arm, hand, and eventually the bat head right to the middle of the ball. And since they front side pull and rotate open, they seldom lunge, and their aim is very accurate. But the cons are, because the hips have to be very explosive to automatically push the rear hip, top arm, and bat handle to snap the bat head through the ball, we find that if their hips are slow, they may get too much independent upper body front side pull without enough top hand and bat head over snap. Johnny McCraw and other hitters with a baseball background will visualize a nail sticking out of the end of the knob of the bat. And they'll use a hip rotation to turn the upper body 
and to drive the hands and the knob forward as if popping a balloon. And this does a good job of aiming and sets up a tremendous lag of the bat head as the hands lead. Instinctively, we're going to trigger that snap at the right time to impact the bat head into the ball. Now, if the rear hip and the top arm extend powerfully, this works awesome. But if the pull dominates the rear side push, again, the snap may be weak. I call this method the stab and snap, and I found I could lower my body and reach forward as I stepped, and then it was easy to explode the hands forward to snap and stab, and it worked best if you focus more on the top arm and top hand. I like the fact that it aims well and it eliminates the urge to lunge, and we taught it for several years. Some of our high arc friends like Big Clay here and Hondo, a couple guys that were really high arc hitters in the Madison area of Wisconsin, really mastered it and became dominant power hitters for high arc. You see a lot of guys using this focus with a basic two-handed grip on the bat. It's because the top hand is really a dominant focus in the swing and it works well that way. The oversnap is excellent if it's done correctly, and I'd categorize both Rusty Bumgarner and Jeff Hall as being in with McCraw on this method. Now many of us have heard from youth coaches this term, throw the hands. You use the hips to throw the hands forward, aiming at the ball and creating a bat lag. Then instinctively, at the right time again, they'll allow the bat head to whip into the ball. And this is a very loose and powerful swing as evidenced by Jeff Wallace, a top pro hitter. I personally feel though it can get a bit out of control. If you focus on the bat head going through the ball with the wrists and forearms totally loose, it generally works best. And an overlap grip makes it even more explosive with both hands being thrown. Again, the snap is going to be crisp if the rear hip thrust is good and pushes that top hand. Now Wallace uses this focus and Scott Kirby, one of the smaller pro players with one of the most powerful swings in the pro game today. He preaches fast hands as he explodes his hands into the ball. I feel the swing is one of the most powerful, but also one that can lack control with, again, the top hand not doing its share of the workload. As we've been teaching so far on this DVD, this is our current method of using rear side aim and push to deliver maximum rotational power. We find this direct connection of the bat head through the top hand into the rear hip thrust is teachable and ideal for most recreational players and allows them to strike the ball with good consistency. The only flaw of this focus can be the tendency to push the entire body forward past the rotation and into a lunging motion. So keeping the weight on the rear foot during the timing and allowing the pitch to come back to you is key for success. To correct these swing flaws takes a concentrated effort both mentally and physically. Let's start with the lunge. Now the first correction you can make mentally is to let the ball come back to you and think of the rotation as bringing the bat head to the ball. Secondly, change your point of contact. A lot of hitters look ahead at the pitcher and pitcher hitting the ball way out here on the second half of the swing. Instead, pitcher the ball coming in closer to you and change your point of contact not only to being off to the side, but just ahead of the front of the body. That way you can sit on the back leg and you can wind and wait and let the ball come back to you. And then again, as we said in step one, let the rotation bring the ball around to a better point of contact just to have your body. We can envision the swing as being quick to the ball. So again, we change our cadence a little bit and we say, wait, 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 explode. Don't think of the swing as being a long, drawn out process. Think of the swing as being quick and explosive. That way we can wait longer and explode faster and make ourselves be quick to the ball. Another mental approach is thinking of driving the ball up in the air. And I know we've talked about that previously in the, this video, but if we think of driving the ball up in the air, we'll naturally get a better body angle back, and our swing is going to be slightly up, and it's going to follow the rotation of the body around. And again, it'll fight the urge to go ahead and swing ahead and down and go past that brace leg and allow ourselves to drift, to drift forward if our timing is off. Again, if we let ourselves wind, get our base foot down as we rotate, and we think of driving any ball up, we're going to have that ability to finish sooner. We get to right here, that's going to want to follow the rotation of the body around on a low pitch. And the low pitches are the ones where we typically want to wind and chase down. Instead of thinking of driving through the ball, hit into the ball as if you're breaking a heavy glass globe. You let the ball come back to you as you try to bring maximum power to the point of impact. Another mental effort that works is to cut down our pre-swing. Take the effort down to a 5% effort. 
real nice and easy a 5% effort. If we have too much pre-swing, try to load up too much, it can force us to be thrown forward into a wild chase of the ball. Absolutely for myself personally, the lunge is one of the biggest problems I have. And I jump from low arc, which is ASA, to unlimited high arc, which is up to 40 feet high. And basically for me, when I get into the high arc, that ball is coming what it feels like straight down to the front of the plate. And you have to fight that tendency to be early. So what I find works effectively for me is to really, again, slow down that pre-swing to 5% or less and to really stay on the back leg and wind. Wind and kind of wait for the pitch to come down. Wind and wait on the timing. Then when you combine that with driving the ball up, and for me personally, I take that cadence from wind, step, swing, I take it just straight back to the old wind and then push snap through or ba-boom. And I put the ball in the wind. Because for me, if I eliminate that motion of stepping, and if I just think wind, I'll find myself stretching here, but still holding the wind in the back leg. So I'll be thinking to myself, ba, and then boom, push snapping through. It takes a lot of discipline to sit back and wait. And some solve this by doing a shuffle step forward. But I find the added motion and timing are hard to keep consistent. And those who have good to hand-eye coordination seem to perform the shuffle better. But for most, it adds another element to an already complicated swing that's breaking down. Finally, if lunging is dominating your swing and these thought adjustments do not fix it for you, you might want to change to a lead arm pull or a stab and snap focus. These have more front side pull and thus the urge to lunge is less. So let's go to the physical end and to fix this we can use a T or soft toss and make sure the point of contact is just the head of the body. And this will help you adjust the point of contact back closer to the body and make you automatically let the pitch come back to you and let the rotation bring it around. Secondly, the brace leg drill is one of the best. Basically you can lean back against that front leg and get the feeling of your body rotating and opening. The guide rope too works well with a T set at the knees which dramatically teaches you to use the hips to lead. The upper body opens at that nice back angle and finally you push snap the bat head through the ball, driving the ball up. So on any of the drills that we've laid out, go ahead and focus on letting the ball come back to you and focus on letting the hips and the upper body rotate to bring the bat head to the ball with a good extension of the top arm. A weak snap of the bat head is almost exclusively found in hitters who have a front side pull focus. And we see this especially in seniors over 60. As they age and become injured, the hips do not turn as explosively and they no longer automatically push and extend the top arm and bat head. There's little snap and the bat head drops below the hands because we don't get that rise as we push an over snap. These hitters find they can no longer hit chest high pitches with much authority. For rec hitters, the fix is simple. Simply go to a rear hip, rear shoulder, top hand, push and extend. Again, the focus we've been teaching this entire tape. If you can't get yourself to pull and automatically rely on the hips to snap, and I'll tell you what, few rec players can, it, and even the pros have trouble with it sometimes, go ahead and use a method that's more intuitive, that's going to deliver a direct connection between the power of the hips, the bad handle, the bad head, and allow you to have that snap. Make sure you turn it. This is a great drill for fixing an improper lead arm drag. When you don't turn that front forearm and wrist properly, the bat head just drags around in an improper angle. That's why this drill is great for correcting that because if you drag it around with the racket, you won't even be able to hit the ball. It forces you to turn that lead wrist and the lead forearm so that you snap it into the ball. In order to finish with the top hand strong, you want to get to the point here and then do the hammer drill where you flex the back wrist and the top hand snaps the bat head right into the ball. I think as an interesting sidebar, most lefties you see have a lot better swing than right-handed batters as a whole for the population. And why that is, I have no idea. My son Brett was always a natural lefty from the time he was a young kid and had a good swing. Now there's a test you can take that maybe shows why. Being a right-handed batter, just have the guy take the lead arm, grab the bat, turn the hips, and swing. And you'll see that probably 90% of rec hitters do this. And it's what I do all the time, and it's a flaw. You see, I'm not hinging my wrist. Instead of turning to allow point of contact way back here in front of the body, I just drag it all the way around. And thus, when I swing, I want to push it way forward, and I want to lunge. 
But I've never practiced batting left-handed, but when I bat in tournaments where we have to bat left-handed, co-ed tournaments, if I turn my hips, I'll turn that wrist. Isn't that weird? It blows my mind, but when I give this test to right-handed batters versus left-handed batters, I find that almost three or four to one, the lefties will turn that wrist to make point of contact here, but the righties will drag it palm down all the way across. And so whether that's something that's built into our genetics, I don't know, but certainly it shows the importance of turning the wrist over to guide to the point of contact, to allow that to hinge properly and to learn that hinge. While being jammed back is a bit less common, nothing robs us of power like being jammed on a rear foot. At least on the lunge, you can swing hard against the front foot and your weight is being shifted. But being jammed back, since we don't transfer the weight to the front foot, all we can do is turn on the back foot and spin. And generally the timing is off and the hitter does not take a strong step forward to widen out the base. Sometimes the step is even away from home plate in the bucket or even on home plate. It's real easy to demonstrate when you're jammed on that rear foot how slowly your hips turn. For instance, if I sit on my back leg and if I never come off the rear foot and never get the weight transferred and I go ahead and wind, I bring the foot down, I'm just going to count one, two, three. That's how long it takes me to push open. But if I allow my weight to transfer onto the front foot, and again, I'm going to try to do it no faster, but if I land one. Wind, land, one. You could say that the hips rotate almost twice as fast. And because we're stretching our base out a little bit and rotating, that bat head is going to track longer as it rotates through. It's going to be in the zone longer as we rotate around. If we're jammed back and just swing off the back foot, the bat path is greatly curtailed. In spring training, Larry Carter was saying after he got loosened up and was hitting good, that he was getting the weight down hard on the front foot. And because he's the lead arm pull guy, he's whined, got the weight down hard, and he could really transfer the weight to the front foot, rotate open well, and it got his weight off of the rear hip. Interesting, but if we get jammed on the rear foot, the fix is to do the opposite of what I did, make it into two-part ba-boom. You want to really focus on that step portion. You want to think, wind, step hard, and then swing hard. And opposite of what we did in the lunge, where I made it the two-part ba Ignored that pretty much and let it happen automatically because I tend to lunge and then went ahead with the boom. Here we'll go ahead on the jam portion to fix it by saying wine ba boom. We'll go wine ba boom. Or in better terms, we'll say wine step swing. Get in our stance and we'll go wine step swing. Over the past two years, we've had the honor of working with a lot of players nationally on their swings and Let's take a practical look at some of the before and after success stories and what they did to correct their flaws. In Rec Cohen, she's a three-tool athlete, hitting for power and average. And once she hits the base pass, she runs like a deer with great top-end speed. On defense, the guys think she looks great playing the field at no less than shortstop. She is E.Y. Waga's softball superstar. However, Jen had a lunge in her swing and found herself chasing the ball with her upper body and miss hitting more balls than she had in the past. I can see right now that I'm stepping all the way out here. Correct. One issue that I have is that I actually lunge when I swing. So what I tried is seeing Laura as I actually bring my foot back and wind up and then swing. And it gives me a little bit better of a hit and it actually lets me hit the whole field rather than just left field. I tried it. it Sometimes the fix is a simple physical and mental adjustment that works immediately. Jen simply added a small pre-swing wind in time this allowed her to time and stay back in the rear leg just long enough to correct her lunge. The biggest thing that for me is timing and definitely that little bit of a wind up and using it to put more power behind my swing definitely helps. So timing. Wind and time. Wind and time. Jared, 24, was a very good high school athlete and a rec level hitter. His overall mechanics were decent, but he was constantly finding himself jammed back in the swing. After analyzing, we realized that he was not getting top arm extension. 
Once he started to push and extend the top arm, improvement was immediate and he shifted his weight better to the front foot and rotated more easily. I keep the weight on my back leg. It helps my hips drive my hands up and through the ball for extension and power. Driving doesn't really explain it. It's like an extension. It's a fast bench press. It's, I've extended it here, but watch now as the top hand extends the rest of the way through. And when I get to this point, I finish my swing with a push snap. Bear is a powerful senior, 63 years old and biker tough. An awesome guy, but he has some leg and shoulder problems. Thus he finds his body mobility is not good, and I suspect his right wrist is overdeveloped from doing 16 ounce curls at Ferg's bar. Over the years, Bear has developed a habit of swinging down with an exaggerated forward point of contact. I would characterize him as a hitter who has trouble radically changing a lifetime of mechanics. I like that. My basic problem is that I'm, I'm so very tight and I don't have a lot of flexibility. So what I'm basically trying to do is get as much weight on my back leg as I can. Then it levels my swing out so that when I do make good contact, I'm hitting a really good line drive. And it's really helped me a lot just keeping that weight as much as I can and keeping my hands back on that back foot. Get a pitch that's between my waist and my chest, and that is a good, really, really great pitch for me to hit. I may not get it out of the park, which I don't really do, but I get a good line drive, usually the middle to left. And, and that's really basically what I've been working on. Paul Sicey has been one of the top high arc hitters in the Midwest. Featured on the cover of our 1999 release of Achieving Maximum Home Run Distance and Consistency. But strangely, as Paul approached 40, he developed a habit of chasing the ball forward, exhibiting a lunge, a lack of oversnap, and a poor point of contact. You know, watching a pro on tape, if, if you've got a preconceived notion of what he's doing, then you're going to see what you want to see. Um, when they're hitting and it, not until you, you really have an understanding of how um, you need to approach the ball and, and where to strike the ball um, will, will you know, watching a professional hit really help you. I felt like um, in order to generate power that I, I need to, to attack forward and towards the ball rather than allow the ball to come back. You know, I see the, see the pros hit and, and you know, they were, they were flying towards the ball and, and you know, I, you know, I thought, boy, I got to get off the back foot and, and really come forward and really attack the ball, and it, it ju just made my problem worse. It wasn't until I started moving up a little bit, you know, still keeping it, keeping it off to the side, that uh, um, I was becoming way more consistent. You know, my, my point of contact was right in front of my body, not over and down, you know, and after my bat head had already, you know, gone over the top and, and, and slowed down a little bit. I had a couple tournaments when I started out pretty bad and you know you don't necessarily have time to go take a bunch of batting practice in between games and and, and basically it's it's not really anything batting practice is necessarily going to cure. For me it would, would help the most when I would just picture um, the ball on the tee and, and try to reinforce where I'm going to make contact and that's just just out front of your body, not way out front but just back into your body, you know obviously not too far back but you know just really re need to reinforce where um, to make contact with the ball, let the ball come back into you more. One of the most powerful 70 age division sluggers in the nation lives in St. Petersburg, Florida and is host of the prestigious Woodlawn Hitting Club. Dave North, or Pops as he is affectionately known, is a softball celebrity, well known by young pros and seniors alike. When he turned 60, Dave was an all world player on a world championship senior team still hammering home runs, until a knee surgery at 64 seemed to magically remove his superpowers. When we videoed his swing two years ago, it was evident he was all front side pull, and the loss of the mobility in his legs after knee surgery basically left him with less hip rotation and very little top hand push and extension. At 69 years old, he started helping us research this program. Dave underwent a two-year lifting, drill, and rear hip and top arm push and extension program that has enabled him to once again regain his power and be among the dominant 70-year-old hitters in the game. I used to yank the bat right out of my, just yank it, 
straight forward like a golf swing. And one of the worst habits I had was using a golf snap, I, and no one showed me any different. While I could hit base hits, I had no power, just lost all my power. So since associating with bogey, showing me a few things, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to incorporate more of a hip turn and, and driving hard with my back hand while keeping my left hand relaxed. The, the, the top hand uh, rear push over snap has, has really helped my bring my power back. At, at 70, I, I hit five or six out the other day in a practice session. And I've been getting about one a tournament, one to two a tournament lately. The beauty of using the push snap method is that it, when you when you come hard with your top hand, it tends to bring the whole body around in a nice rotational swing. The nice thing is you can use the same swing whether you're going for a, a top spin line drive or a, a hitting the bottom half of the ball, going for the long ball or a home run. A lot of practice, but uh, it, it proves one thing that you can teach a real old dog new tricks. As he gets ready to turn 71, his worth ethic and level of play is an inspiration to all of us who hope to play forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. A former New York State heavyweight medalist and running back, he lacked power when necessary due to an inside-out swing. However, by adapting more rear side top arm push and extension, his swing is remarkably different today. All right, last year, during spring training, I was more of a top hand basically following. It wasn't doing anything, it was basically just long for the ride. Now this year, I'm a little bit more top hand push, getting a little bit more power, getting a little bit more underspin on, on my home run ball, and it, it helped me improve a lot this year. The hips pushing, kind of get my hands out to get that top hand over. Basically, got everything to go in motion instead of me just trying to come with this lead hand and basically the top hand wasn't coming around with it. What you're doing is punching through the ball with your top hand. And that's all it's doing, punch through the ball, and that's that top hand. Getting the bat head forward out with that punch, you're going through a boom. We get into one, I can, I can really feel the hips and the top hand going all together and it's blending as one. And that's what you really want to get with that top hand push. Woo! Oh, Woo! Big one shot, big Phil first contacted us about six or seven years ago after watching one of our videos and he was struggling to shift his weight better and often found himself falling off the front foot or worse, looping the swing in an up angle. He's one of the smartest thinkers I've worked with and has helped us develop a lot of the drills in our program. My swing was just a basic, basic grip. I never even thought about bottom half of the ball, top half of the ball, because I would just turn and I would just drag the bat over not even knowing because I have no push. I'm not driving the bat anymore. I was just, I might as well swing with one arm. I was just up there and I would just go into the ball and I would just throw the bat at it. Um, very weak swing. But now after watching all these big hitters, they always talk about that push, squat, get that, get that back leg involved. So I started doing that. So I'll stand up here and I'll feel that weight. I'll feel that tension. And when that ball's coming in, even though I'm going forward, the weight is still back where before, I would be like this, my body came forward along with it. Now I wait back, weight's on my leg, I actually feel the tension. When I'm going forward, it looks like I'm going, spreading weight, but I'm still back. Now I'm coming forward, now I'm pushing, and now top hand, I'm pushing the bat through the zone, where before I would have just dragged the bat through the zone. These are all tips I've learned after four years of hitting with Ken. I'm extending both arms and I'm still pushing with my top hand, so as I'm coming through the zone, I'm driving and full extension out with the push. I know four years sounds like a lot of time to practice and try to improve, but why play the game if you don't want to be better? It took me four years and it was worth every swing. I've learned so much. I'm a much better hitter now, much more confident, and I actually enjoy the game more. I was, first of all, I was chopping down on the ball. And he told me to swing level and throw the hips into it. And I'm doing that now, and I'm driving the ball much further than I've ever done. And uh, it's it's invigorating to me. Pushing through with the top hand, I always was taught to use this hand. But by pushing through with this top hand, I get almost double my power and double direction. I mean, it, it comes off, it's a lot more 
force than before. Before it looped, now it comes straight off like a line drive. Here's a group of hitters that are physically incredible. At 60 years old, the famous stone man, Steve Stone, is ripped. Breeze is physically fit in his 50s. Chris in his late 20s is a fireman and a dynamo of power. It's ironic that these are the type of hitters who do not need to overswing, but mentally find themselves loading up and doing just that. Stoneman has learned to relax, develop a more even paced tempo, and thus a swing he can control with confidence. You've patiently listened to our presentation, so now without further editorial comments, let's hear from eight of the best young pros in the Super Major game. We only list their current back company affiliation, for in this competitive field, teams often change. We can't even begin to list how many all-world awards, MVPs, long-haul bomber championships, and world championships they've won individually. You can find that stuff out on the web or softball magazine. Just understand that these are the absolute best in the game. And it's an honor to be able to listen to and understand a bit more about them and how they approach the highest level of softball on the planet. This year, uh, one of the things that I prepared more about home runs and games is uh, I tried to run a lot more, do a lot more squats, because sort of like a basketball player, once your legs go, you lose half your swing, you know, things are just fading away. So I thought to uh, come in better condition, legs in shape, hitting a lot more. Just getting my body ready for the for the derby and also tournament play. I swing a 30 ounce bat. Uh, the heavier, the better for me. That's what I prefer. I feel like if you can swing a heavier bat as quick as you can a lighter bat, you're going to hit it further. I come through the zone. I'm coming through. I want to bring my hips and arms and extend good. You want the good extension. You want the hip play. You want to get all your body weight you can get into it. A lot of guys get in there, they just get tied up using their arms. A lot of guys don't even want to let go of the bat. So that's what I try to tell everybody when you prepare yourself is to come through, make sure you get the extension, and just follow through with your body. You want to get that bat head whipped out there. The difference between my home run swing and my base hitting swing is really just the way I prepare to hit the ball. If I'm going to hit a home run, I will try to catch the bottom half of the ball because I want to spin the ball out of the park. And if a base hit, I want to catch more of the middle of the ball so I can drive it into where I want to hit it. You also want to work on base hitting too. I mean, I hit backside 30, 40 balls every time I go out. Sort of uh, not having a good weekend. What I try to do is I don't try to hit the pitcher, but that's where I'll go. I'll go up the middle to get everything back to where you start it. If you'll start pulling out, your back gets slow. So the main thing I do is I'll concentrate on hitting up the middle to get everything back going smooth again, get you two or three good middle shots, get a good rhythm going, and then you can go back to blasting them again. A lot of things I see people doing, rec league or wherever I'm at, a lot of times they'll get out here and they're lunging, keeping their body forward. A lot of times I'll keep I'll keep almost 75-80% of my weight here and just stay back. And when you see the ball come, first thing you gotta do is get them hands out there. Get it quick, then that'll hold you back from like jumping and lunging at the ball. You know, even though I'm a major player, I understand, you know, people getting nervous. I mean, even out here, that's the reason once you get the technique down, you know, once your fundamentals get through, you know, the nerves, your fundamentals, your game comes through and then the nerves leave you. Uh, being with the Long Haul Bombers, you know, it's a nervous event. My first event was in Colorado. I was so nervous, I thought I was going to throw up before I even went out there. So, I mean, it's just like, you know, some games I get nervous, but the Bombers, I guess, the crowd, the atmosphere, the major league players down on the field. Then when you finally hit your first one, it's like all your jitters go away. You know, everybody talks about Barry hitting them in the cove, and it was just a great experience that I could say I actually hit one out there with Barry's hitting them. I guess my worst weekend was in Texas last year. I think I ended up hitting like 400. Sometimes you just have those weekends where it seems like nothing you do is right. You just gotta hold your head up and go out and practice all week. I mean, it was just like I wasn't doing nothing right. You know, everything I'd done was 
if I hit something good, it was right at somebody. So, you know, the most thing, only thing I could do is just, just one of those weekends, you gotta shake it off, go take a bunch of BP and get ready for the next weekend. I played uh, six years of minor ball. I actually uh, made it up to double A for a couple years. Uh, met a lot of guys and uh, played with some good players. Albert Pujols, uh, I, I can go on down the line. But uh, uh, one of the things I learned in softball, of course, without just the maturity level of me being older, but, uh, but how to generate bat speed. And uh, when you generate bat speed in softball, it, when it translates into the baseball swing, if you can take a, a little bit longer, it, the softball swing to me is a little bit longer swing. I was very short in baseball. But um, uh, if you see most of the lefties today in baseball have a little bit longer swing, and I feel like that sometimes can aid you even in baseball, even when the guys are throwing really hard. So uh, I definitely think the softball has aided me. And, uh, it would have been nice. It would have been nice to go back when I was 30 years old like I am now. If you guys do want a tip on hitting, uh, the best one I can give without getting too technical is exploding your hands and being strong with your hands because I feel that sometimes guys, they get too worried about loading up and getting their body into a position to hit. If you worry about your hands and getting your timing right and swinging hard in BP, then your hands will get you in the right position to hit and your body will actually get in the right position for your hands to hit. So it works hand in hand. I think if you concentrate on your hands first, concentrate on your hands first, getting to the ball and getting the barrel to the ball as hard as possible, your body should take, should take a, a good path and get your hands in a good position to hit. Because I believe that if you worry about your body, your hands aren't going to get there. If you worry about your hands, your body will, your body will get in position for your hands to work for you. I think that sometimes you can learn, though, from taking a lot of swings. It's good to get out there and take a lot of swings because you'll learn what works for you. I believe that swinging hard is the key to generating power. Just get out there and hit, man, and be explosive when you get to the ball. Be explosive with the hands first, not your body. I've had a lot of people ask me about my swing over the years, and uh, just the main thing really is they see my leg kick, which is you know big exaggerated leg kick, and they ask me, you know, is that something I should be doing? And uh, my, my advice really is simple as, you know, take bits and pieces. You can't really copy any one swing. My swing, if you've watched a lot of guys play, I'm short really for our game. So uh, a lot of it for me is leverage and that leg kick is timing for me. That starts my swing. When I've, when I've found a pitch I like, I get that leg going. That's the first thing that goes. And everything else is not moving. My head, shoulders, hands, everything else is back. So I haven't committed anything yet but my front leg. And then everything whips at once. Hands, front hip, everything goes together. That's what gives you, that's what gives you the bat speed. Obviously, we all know the bat speed is what drives the ball far and hard. Uh, and that's just been something I've developed over the years is that leg kick. I honestly, I couldn't tell you how high it is when I'm doing it. It is just 100% habit at this point. When I've picked out, when I determine my pitch, when I'm going to go, I always try to go out and get that ball. I don't let that ball get anywhere near me, so I'm not getting tied up. Uh, definitely want to meet it up high in the chest. I always try to get everything out here. You adjust where your upper body position is by where that front foot ended up. It, you know, when, I, when you put that foot out there and it's gone, you can still make adjustments. My upper body is still high. I am not leaned way back. I'm still tall, and I can adjust accordingly with my hands and torso as I come forward. Um, like I said, it's really, it's all part of it. Hitting is timing. It is timing, repetition, and pitch selection. It's that simple, folks. That is, that is hitting. Watch my particular swing and you'll notice once my leg is gone and I'm down, I've got this position where my front is gone, okay, I have really good balance from this position. You still have to maintain excellent balance to hit a ball hard, hit a ball far, and be consistent, which is the main thing is consistency is what we're looking for in, in slow pitch softball. So what I've done here from this position, now it's just throwing. I, I'm a firm believer in you throw your hands like you're throwing the bat head right at the ball. The best ex explanation would be like if you're chopping wood. When you chop wood, when you come over the top, you throw it down. It's the same way with a softball bat. You get it going, you pick your pitch, that leg goes, and now you just, boom, throw your hands, follow through. Don't stop that bat at contact. A lot of people make the mistake. They make contact, bat head slows down. That's the exact particular point where that bat head should be going as fast as it can through contact. You try to hit that ball like it weighs 20 pounds. Go right through that ball. Do not slow your bat down at contact. Keep it going. Finish, arms extended, everything's moving. 
and pull. For me, I am a huge top, you know, my bottom hand does most of my work. If you watch my, my grip, my top hand is off the bat. There it is. I've got about two and a half, three fingers on the whole bat at all times. So I've taken my top hand pretty much out of play here. It's just a guide, helps me. I push with it a little bit, but everything is right here. Lead arm, pull, follow through. This arm comes off. You know, guys that are thick across the chest, you can't, you know, you're going to lose that, that, that hand's going to come off. Your top hand's going to come off sooner than, than guys that are, you know, not quite as thick across here. That's just the way it is. Once you make contact, what happens to this hand doesn't really matter. Just finish and follow through, throw the bat head through the ball. You think your, leave, your rear hip and your top hand do come around automatically and help? Yeah, and I come forward. If you watch, if you watch my finish, you know, this back foot after contact, I'll have, you know, swung, made contact, and then this back leg will come off the ground and I'll toe drag. My swing plane is, is pretty flat. You'll see a lot of guys who, who hands, you know, they're way down here and they'll come up, up really high through the ball. I don't really do that. My plane, my hands start high. When I load and go back, they actually even get a little bit higher. And my plane is more of a, just a real slight uppercut plane. Like again, I like to meet the ball out front, way up high in the chest. I know when I meet a ball out here, if I am just trying to hit home runs, I want to meet the ball up here. I know I can spin this ball. This ball is good. The ball's coming down at an angle. You want that bat head coming up slightly, catching that ball. Drive that bat head through the ball. That is that is my swing. And it's just a big finish. Leg goes. Body still nice and tall. Everything still. Throw it. Throw the hands. Hands are loose. Just throw it right at the ball. Finish up. Let it go on the follow through, man. Drive through that ball. I just, you know, just get in there and picture that bat head flying through the ball. Do not overthink this stuff, folks. Just get in there, pick your pitch, be selective, know what pitches you can do certain things with, and then just go after it. Swing at it, controlled, but aggressive. Me personally, I, I never swing away for power. Oh, not, I won't say never. Last year going into the World Series, I only had 19 home runs. Then we're playing a, a limited home run game. 90% of the time, 95% of the time on 300 foot parks. There's no need for me to hit a home run. I, I, if I can get on base, the big boys, they're, that's what they're there to do. They, they all can hit. They all can hit just as good, if not better than anybody. But they also have more power than anybody on the team. So I have power, but I don't need to swing away. Uh, my whole game is base hit. Now, if the bases are loaded and we're, then I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably hit a home run. But if not, my, my game is just base hitting. Just, it's practice, practice, practice. You can, you can end up hitting it wherever you want. First baseline, third baseline, middle. You can hit the bottom of the ball, the top of the ball, the middle of the ball. It's all about practice, practice, practice. Take, go out and take your swings. Hit three, four times a week as much as you can. Try to find a BP partner where you can hit 100, 200 balls four times a week. And you're going to be able to pinpoint. You're going to be able to hit that ball on top of the ball. You're going to be able to hit it through the middle, hit some knuckle balls, and spin the ball. You'll be able to spin the ball whenever you want. But it's all about just practice, practice, practice. I, I personally don't really believe in cutting the swing back because that you're, you're just asking to make outs, I think, if you cut the swing back. I mean, if I swing hard, if I swing hard and I'm trying to cut it, sometimes if you cut it, you swing down, you try to cut that ball and get that line drive, you may cut it out for a home run. And that, you know, that happens. But if I'm going to go up there and I'm just going to kind of do a little thing here, a little thing there, and I make an out, now I'm going to look stupid. I would much rather make an out swinging hard, whether it's a home run for an out, a solo, or a hard hit ball to shortstop. I don't believe in taking off your swing because now you're just hurting yourself. I'm a better backside hitter today than I was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. I would watch the ball get behind me and I would step and I'd throw the bat and I'd push. I wouldn't pull because I think when you pull to go backside, I think you're going to get this. You're going to get more of somebody that's trying to pull through and, and pull and sure. got it. I mean, that's, that's the whole key for me going backside is letting the ball get past me, using the same swing I would in a situation I was pulling. I'm just backed off the plate. Like I said before, I'm not, not going to try to trick or deceive the infielders or outfielders. If I execute, it doesn't matter that they know I'm way off the plate and that I'm thinking backside. A lot of people, they get and stay in the same position, and they say, OK, if it's outside, I'm going to go backside. Well, I'm not that good. I need to set up, be stationary, know what I'm doing before I even leave the batter's box. Know the, uh, the situation. If a guy in front of me just hits a two, three run homer, and we got 16 home runs in and out, 
I know as soon as it goes over the fence what I'm coming to the plate to do. So I know I'm gonna be backed off. I get a hit if I execute. If I don't execute, I hit it right to them. You know, and they make a play, you're out. When I make outs and I make them, man, it's like the ball's coming. Well, that's outside, let me go backside. All right, that's in. I can turn on that. You know, I make a lot of outs when I change my mind when I'm in the box. So I think confidence and knowing what you're gonna do before you get in there, knowing the situation, makes you a 50 to 100 points a year better hitter. So I used to do that, change when I got in the box, but for, like for the last decade, I've made up my mind, that is where I'm gonna know what I'm doing when I'm on deck. I'm a team player, so like I said, if the guy before me hits a homer and we're playing limits, I know I'm not gonna pull it. I know I'm not gonna hit a homer. Well, you know, they, a lot of people say, well, how do I hit it farther? Well, hit the bottom quarter of the ball, spin it. You know, you're not, you're not basically hitting the ball in the middle of the ball where you have a problem like I do and hit a lot of knuckleballs. Uh, if you hit that bottom quarter of the ball and you can spin it, it's gonna go and fly a lot further. I have a, I have a, uh, an old uh, post in the back of my yard, a little eight by eight, and holes drilled, and I have a, a tire that's basically cut through the middle now it's sagging, so I gotta get a new tire. <laughs> but when you first cut it, they're almost still touching. And I would always basically make contact and try to push through it. So that helped me, you know, with forearm strength, with turning over, you know, pushing the ball. So everybody's got their own thing in grip, stance, you know, where they hit the ball. Uh, what's good for me might not be good for you. Back in 1995, I started playing a little bit more travel ball and uh, got hooked up with Ty Drilling, who lives probably about 20 minutes from me right now. And, uh, you know, he, he's, I consider him my mentor and has always established himself as a class, uh, a class act, an integrity man, not only on and off the field, but he, uh, you know, he's just a great, he's a great person. He's a great ball player. I mean, he's 44 years old right now and uh, he's probably still one of the top players in the, in the circuit. What we do when we get to the BP field, uh, we'll just play some catch, we'll play some long toss for about 15, 20 minutes, just kind of get loose. Uh, then we'll do some, uh, some sprints, we'll jog around a little bit, get the body, get the body loose, stretch our legs. Uh, and then, then, we'll, then we'll start working on, you know, our, our right side gaps, you know, just go through the whole gamut on what we want to do, what we want to accomplish. Uh, sometimes if we're on, if our mechanics are right and we're feeling good, we don't need to take any a lot of a large amount of swings. We're gonna go right side. You know, Todd will start out. He'll probably take 15, 20 over there. Uh, then, <clears throat> then he's gonna go to the right center gap. After the right center gap, then I'll switch. I'll switch in, and uh, he'll pitch to me, and I'll go through the same routine. You know, we'll work on our right side a four hole, and then we'll go to the right center gap. Probably take about 20, 25 swings, and then uh, then we'll switch back, and then we'll work on the left center gap, and then we'll work on pulling down the line. So in a, if, if we're consistent on a good day, if we don't have to really work on a certain mechanics, we'll probably take no more than 50, 60 balls. You still got to work on your mechanics. And the one thing that I do to work on mechanics is that I'll hit off the tee into the net. That way it allows you to get back to the basics, keep your eyes still, keep your head still, and get back to a nice fluid swing instead of jerking everything through. They ask, you know, how, do, how, do we, how should we hold the bat? Do we line up our knuckles? Uh, what I'll try to do is, uh, you know, I, I drop one pinky, I'll put two on top. But just kind of waggle like you have a golf club. Just kind of waggle it, get it comfortable, get it loose in your hands, and then bring it up, and your hands are right where they should be. They're right in, the, they're right in alignment where they should be. And this way it's going to allow you to throw not only your hands, but your barrel simultaneously at the ball. Everybody talks about their athletic stance. You know, knees are slightly bent, and I'm gonna have, like I said, a good 85% of my back leg to where all my weight, because when I go, I'm going everything through. My whole body, my swing, my upper, my lower body is going through, and I'm gonna just tap. I'm tapping to keep everything back so that I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, and then, and then I'll give a little leg kick. I'll give a little leg kick to keep that weight back just to remind me to utilize that power, and then, finish. One motion, through the ball, line drive, good trajectory. You want to throw the barrel at the ball. You want to stay behind it, keep the bat behind the ball so you're hitting it square. I'm here and I'm throwing the barrel. 
driving, I'm driving with my front, driving with my front, and then I'm finishing with my back to contact that ball in that window. What I've been doing in the off season as far as uh, conditioning and training, uh, I've been working with the trainer with the speed and agility core training to where it's utilizing uh, it's a lot of explosive fast switch fibers to where it's going to allow me to uh, use, my, use my body and use my muscles to maximize my, my hip rotation, busting through, uh, driving through with the bat and finishing and exploding through the ball. It's a lot of repetition. Uh, lighter weights, uh, quick, fast twitch, footwork, uh, twist, medicine ball. But what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is what I'm getting across is a lot of guys always say to me, geez, your swing looks so smooth and you don't, it looks effortless and you don't look like you're swinging that hard, which in, in essence is true to a point, and that's a lot of it. You want to keep this, this right here, what you're doing and hitting, as simple as possible because the more things you incorporate into your swings, the more things that can go wrong. And, that, and that's what gets a lot of us in trouble. And what I'm saying is a lot, the biggest mistake I probably see slow pitch guys do is over exaggerate their stride diving into the ball because they think they gotta get so much into it to get the ball to do the things they want, which isn't, if you look at the best golfer in the world, Tiger Woods, his swing looks so effortless. He's hitting it further than anybody on the tour just because it's ball striking. And that's the, the one thing I would say to anybody out there that wants to, to get better, is work on ball striking. Just work on striking the ball consistently. And consistent is the name of this game. So what I'm saying, like most people say to me, you know, you don't really, your, your swing looks flat or, you know, whatever the case may be, which isn't the case. For me, when I'm in, I've already locked in. So my hands, as soon as I go up, now my hands are already in place right here to cut the ball. So I've already got my cut in place, which is where my hands, where I set my hands up high, now I can cut down, and then I can flatten my swing out so I'm not getting in trouble by over-exaggerating like the chop. You see a lot of guys do that, over-exaggerate the chop, and that's what gets you in trouble because you end up cutting it too much, or you just hit a weak round ball or something like that. You know, slow your bat speed down, and it's about ball striking. It's get yourself in position, keep it as simple as possible. I go up, my, my swing is simple. Hands up, short stride, and I'm gone to the ball. Don't get into, uh, you see all these guys get into the fancy dancy stuff, and you know, it, it's, this if you're, if, you know what, if that's your thing and you're having fun, you stay with it. But if you truly want to get better and work on some things and take some things to heart, the only thing I can say is you work on ball striking. The rest of it will come. When you, when you can strike that ball consistently, the rest of this game will come to you a lot easier than maybe what it is at this point. With my hand, if you notice a lot of times, my top hand's hardly even ever on the bat. And that's just, I'm up here and it's just, it, this here is just simply a guide. Hitting is all done with your bottom hand. It is simply pulling this knob to the ball. And that's where hitting is. This hand right here, if, you've got, if you're holding this for all your worth, chances are you're gonna roll the ball over or not get done what you're trying to get done. So what I'm saying to you is pull. This hand right here is all hitting. If you're successful pulling this bat right here, like this, through the knob, that's what you want to get done. This hand here is just simply a guide for follow through and to keep your bat on plane where you're heading to go. Once I've got into place and, and my swing is finishing, I'm pretty level. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty level in that, and that's by choice because my philosophy is I, I'm just trying to be consistent, and I just try to get in there and get get level and get to the ball as good as I can. And I think that gives me my best chance for success in hitting. And that's just keeping everything simple. For me, I, I'm, I, I have an open stance. For, simple, for the simple fact, I approach it, I'm up in the box, and I keep an open stance. For, the, for this reason, especially for bigger guys, more than probably maybe a little bit of smaller guys, the easiest thing to do is, the, the best thing about hitting is being open. So if I'm already open, I don't have to worry about clearing my hips. I don't have to worry about stepping in the wrong place and shutting my hips down, they're already open. So all I gotta worry about is getting this bat to the ball. Some people might not even know what it is, but everybody has a timing mechanism. And for me, it's my hands. I go by my hands. I get my hands, when my hands are set and ready to go in place, I just, my hands go, and then the rest of my body goes with it. For you, it might be the high leg kick, it might be, you don't know, you know? It's just, everybody, you gotta find out your timing mechanism, keep it as simple as you can, and you're probably going to be a lot more successful at the play. So what, what I'm saying is when you're getting to the ball, it's the, the best way, the way I think of hitting or the way I try to have the bat feel in my hand is to act like this, this is just a string. 
and there's a ball on the end of the string. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get this string straight so you can go. Now the string's straight, now the ball is following behind, and then you get that snap and the whip at the end of it. And that's just something, I know it may sound silly, it may sound, but that's how I worked on to get where I got. I just act like this is a whip in my hand. And, that, and that's exactly what it is. You just try to use, get as much leverage out of this bat as you possibly can. What I'm, what I'm getting at about, about cutting the ball and that, and that little bit of whip at the end is I worry about, I want to feel that right here. I want to feel this right here, that snap. I want to see that bat come through, the bat head come through, and I want to snap that bat head to the ball out in front of me because that's where the greatest bat speed is. Not back here, don't get caught up and push the ball. The greatest bat speed is right here, and that's where I want to get to. Generally for me, I try, the way I look at it, I try to go at about 70%. Because there's no, it, especially with the pitchers nowadays you're dealing with, everyone's got a pretty good knuckleball, so you have to wait. I mean, that's the name of the game. You got to wait until you can get to the ball where it's at, and just and try to be. If you go 100% full bore, chances are you're going to get caught up. You're going to do something wrong, over stride, over swing, do something. For me, if I'm 70%, I got time. If I made a mistake where the ball is going to be or where I want to get to the ball, I, at 70%, I still have time to adjust my swing somewhere in here to readjust it to get to the ball where it is. She's, I, I think probably the Dudley a, a few years ago, I didn't, didn't have such a good weekend, but uh, it was just one of them weekends where my mechanics was just not there. And, you know, and, and like you're saying, the breakdown, I didn't, I didn't recognize what I was doing, but what I, at the end of the tournament, and I did get to watch some film, someone was filming it lucky enough. And, I, and I, what I was doing in that is I was over striding because it was a little bit of a windy day and the knuckleballs were really moving that day. So I was overcompensating, trying to get to the ball a little earlier. And then that's what was happening is I was catching the ball way out in front and just beating it down into the ground or, or not doing it. You know, the thing is, is we all have, you know, bad weekends, bad days. But if you're consistent, it, it, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the year, you're going to be pretty happy with yourself. We just, we just finished an exhibition out here at the uh, Softball Magazine Spring Training. And, uh... Just like with the long haul bombers, uh, I hit one week in uh, one of the events last year, I hit 12 out of 15. And uh, uh, out of those 12, I mean, you probably really only hit, if, you, if you're lucky enough, you hit half of them right on the button. And, and that's, that's being, you know, that's, that's uh, actually, you know, being a little exaggerated. You might, you're only hitting about 30% of the balls on the sweet spot, perfect in those events. But what, what saves us is, uh, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. So that, that helps carry the ball a little further and, and good technique. I mean, you can miss a ball, but if you've got good hip drive and, and your, your hands get through the ball, you don't have to hit it right on the sweet spot and you can still carry enough to get you a home run. So uh, like, for instance, the last ball I hit to win it last year, when they told me you got to have this ball to win, I didn't hit that ball right on the button. Uh, you know, I missed it, but it had, the wind was blowing, which helped it, but it had a good, a good enough backspin. I got enough of the ball to where it carried out and I won the event. So, so every swing is not going to be perfect and hit right on the button. But if, if you work on your technique and, and some of the things in your swing, you'll get away with some of those miss hits. And 90% and of the time, it'll be a hit instead of an out. We've, we've had some guys out here today that, that uh, one of the biggest things is they overextend early in their swing. And I corrected that. And then they see that the, their bat, they get the bat through the zone quicker. And, and even though they miss a couple balls, they're still hitting them further than they normally would. And some of them were going out of the park. Some of them were hitting the fence when normally they were falling about 15 feet short. So, so just that minor adjustment on some of the swings with these guys add 15 feet to the ball, that's a difference in an out and a home run, or, you know, it just, it gets more zip on the ball getting through the infield too. And, and I've, I've given them a couple drills to go home and practice to where that'll teach them to get their hands through the ball and get their hips into it. And, and hopefully that'll, that'll uh, help their game a little bit. And that's what they're here for is to improve their game. And hopefully we, we can, you know, we can help them in that. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be one that gets to be so-called instructor here when I need to be having somebody watch me half the time and instruct my swing. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a fun time to be out here and, and work with guys that, that look up to you. We were, we were hitting some you know, balls a pretty long way, but some of them we were missing and still going out of the park. And, and some of the flaws and some of the things that, that I still do wrong in my swing that I know I do, and, and sometimes just, it's just a lack of mental focus or what, that, that you, know, you, uh, you still get into those bad habits. One, first of all, pitch selection is everything. So, I mean, a lot of times you get into swinging oh, bad pitches. That's the first flaw that anybody has, really. Oh, but my as far as my swing good, goes, man. When, I, when I'm in the box, a lot of times when, I want, when I'm thinking about hitting the ball a long way, I tend to load up. And what that means is I'll, I'll, I'll drop the hands and load up, and by the time the ball gets to me, I'm not getting to it fast enough. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really try to stress the, the hip turn. I really try to stress getting the hands through the ball, almost like the nail sticking out of the bottom of your bat and you popping the balloon. The ball's the balloon and you're popping it as you come through. But 
sometimes you uh like like i said when i over when i overload when i have to try to catch up my hips still turn but the bat drags behind me but sometimes i still get enough of the ball where it'll go out especially on a smaller field like this but but those are things where uh, you know, if, you, if you're really doing it right, you don't load up, you get your hands through, your hips turn, everything comes in one motion, and you hit the ball out front, and that's when you get those real long home runs that everybody oohs and ahs about. But some drills that I've showed some guys out here to do, uh, one about trying to get your hands through, you know, you go up to a fence, put your bat on your belly, it's an old baseball trick, and uh, you, get, you get against the fence, and then you work on swinging and getting the hands through without hitting the fence. And that teaches you to get the hands through first, teaches you to pop the balloon, or so to speak, an ice pick in your hand and stabbing something. And then uh, the other one to get hip turn, I like to put the bat behind my back and pretend I'm gonna hit a ball with it like this. That way when you hit it, your hips are used, you're using your hips to hit the ball. That's the way, you know, this teaches you hip drive, teaches you to turn your hips and, and really get your hips into the ball. That's where all your power comes from. Your legs and your hips are where most of the power comes from in, in any power hitter you see. You have the biggest arms in the world but if you ain't getting any hip drive and any turn on your swing, you can stand there all day and swing with the biggest arms in the world, but you're not going to hit anything anywhere. You know, I do them separately, of course. You can't do them all at one time, but in your swing, they, that all comes together in one motion. I mean, it's, it's not like your hands come through and then your hips come through because, you know, you're doing two separate drills. Everything has to be fluid and in one motion. So when I load and my, my weight's still back here, when I come through, the hands go and the hips go at the same time. So everything goes in one motion and comes through the ball, and you finish out here. That way, you know, if your belly button's taking a picture of the pitcher, that means you've got your right hip turn. That's another baseball term they used to say, take a picture of the pitcher with your belly button. So when you turn, your, pick, your, face, your belly should be facing the pitcher. And I got a big belly, so it's facing the pitcher. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to stress is that it's all one motion. The, the hips and the hands all have to go at one time. If your hips go early and your hands don't, your back drags, you hit the ball behind you. If your hands go first and your hips don't come, you, all you're doing is slapping it with your arms. So it's all got to be one fluid motion and just right through the ball, just like that. Like you said, I, I, I swing upward a little bit. Well, when I, when I get in my stance, I do my front shoulder is up in the air a little more. I mean, it's just because, you know, I guess from over the years, you know, the ball's coming at that angle. So I want to be in that same angle as the ball is coming in. So I'm, I'm on almost like a level plane with the ball because it comes in at this angle. If my shoulders are at that angle, we're, we're, I'm pretty level with the ball. So when I go back through that same zone where my shoulder is, it looks like I'm swinging up, but I'm actually catching the ball and meeting it level right out front here. So what happens is when I go, I come through here, I get to this point, and when I come through, I just come on around. Like, like uh, some people, like you were just saying, kind of snap it over to keep the ball, to keep on top of the ball where it's, it's not, I mean, it's, you're going right back through where the ball came, so you're in essence having a level swing on it. So you can bring your hands all the way through. I just let mine go. I, I still got the old baseball grip, so mine, Mine just comes through here and then follows it on out. Talking about the, uh, the, the nail at the end of the bat, popping the balloon, so to speak. Uh, I see a lot of guys, uh, when they come through, you know, they're working on getting the bat through, but then all of a sudden they just kind of they, they kind of drag, you know, drag their shoulder through instead of letting the bat whip through. A lot of them, some of them even hold the bat all the way around. They don't even let the bat go. What, what I suggest, and a lot of the guys, you, you'll hear a lot of the other hitters say the same thing, when you get to this point and you're stabbing the balloon and then coming on through, you, you roll that wrist on through to let the bat whip and that'll just give you that added distance and power on the ball. When you, when you come through and, 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 and kind of stay stiff, it locks your whole swing down. From this point, you're, you're done, your swing's over. If you, if you come through, roll the wrist and let it go, you, you're finishing your swing even more and it just gives you added distance on the ball. It, it comes off the bat a lot harder. Oh, dang it. Well, when, when you train for softball, I mean, uh, you know, everybody's got a different workout. Uh, for me, of course, I've had uh, I've had shoulder surgeries on both. I've had two on the right, two on the left, and I'm I'm, I'm needing another one on my right right now. But uh, the left ones, I, I kept tearing my rotator from diving for balls in the outfield. That's what that's what caused it. The more I dove and, and landed on it, just kept tearing and tearing. So. Had to have it repaired twice. The right one from throwing, I, I completely tore it uh, a couple years back, had reconstructive surgery on it, and it's kind of acting up again now. So I don't know if I'm gonna try to get through this season without having surgery first and then do it at the end of the season. Um, but as far as workouts and training, off season, I'll try to go to the gym four days a week. During the season, two to three maybe, three at the most. Uh, I'll go in on Tuesday and do legs. This is in season, of course. Uh, legs on Tuesday, that way they're fresh by the time the weekend comes around to play. 
then I'll do everything else on Wednesday and Thursday. And then Friday's a kind of a travel day and a rest day. So when we get out there on Saturday, I'm, I'm fresh. But uh, I do a lot of uh, a lot of reps and a medi medium weight. Um, I just because all I want to do is just just keep my strength there and just kind of stay lean and not not really get bulky. Because a few years I tried to get do really heavy lifting and got got bulked up, and then my swing got slower. I, I felt like I was all bound up and couldn't get the bat through the zone. So. Uh, Doing a lot of reps and lower weight it helps me stay flexible. So uh, I think that's helped me a lot in my hitting because you know I'm flexible to go and, 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 and hit whatever pitch comes in there, and I can really I can really turn on them. Before when you're all bulky, it's hard to do that. Me and Rusty started doing a thing a, a, a year ago where you do 21. Just like if you're going to do chest one day, you do 21 reps. You do five different lifts and just do one set of 21s. And uh, the last uh, the last six or seven. Uh, reps of that one set should be kind of difficult. The first, or the first 15 are for really for speed and agility, you know, muscle uh, stamina, and then the last six are really when you get your strength. If you're having a struggle to get those last six up, that's where you, you, you keep your strength, and uh, as well as leaning out. So that's, that's been the best workout I've ever have ever done, and I continue to do it now. And that's any body part you work on, uh, you do those 21s, and it, you'll you'll see some good results out of it. How many one of us in, in our in our careers have had bad weekends. I mean, I think I hit, honestly had a weekend, I think in Minnesota one time where I hit like three something right at 400. I mean, that, I used to hit that in baseball. So, you know, when, when a guy playing softball hits something that low, the first thing he'll do is just run and hide. But uh, when I went back that week and started working on, you know, going back to BP and hitting a bunch of balls, you know, I had Jeff and Rusty there and they were, uh, they saw the little thing I was doing in my swing that, I was loading too much. I mean, I was really getting in. I was up there moving my bat a lot. I was, you know, I was dropping the hands a whole lot more over exaggerated than normal. And it was just, it was just slowing me down. I wasn't catching up with anything. So uh, just them pointing that out, you know, that you, you work on those things after somebody sees it and tells you what you're doing, just like we're doing out here. We all need somebody to, to tell us what we're doing wrong. And, and, you know, cause you can't see it yourself. You got somebody else watching you. So I just worked on it and, you know, and, and, and concentrated on not doing the things that I was doing wrong. And, and it just got me back on it the next week, got your confidence back up. I mean, heck, you know, we all get, even the first at bat of every tournament, I get nervous. And every time I've stepped up to the plate at the long haul bombers, my knees are shaking. So it's a, it, it's a game, but none of us are perfect. And, and, and we're all getting nervous. And, and, that, and even, you know, nervous causes some bad, some, you know, bad habits as well. But it's a, uh, they all can be overcome if you just work on what you're doing wrong and, and just keep, you know, keep at it. It'll, it'll, it'll get better. And with these rec guys out here, like you say, rec guys, I hate saying that. It just don't even sound right. But, but uh, it, once we point out one or two things they're doing wrong, every one of them is going to become better hitters. And, and, and like I told a lot of these guys here, you know, they say something about, I, I wish I could play on a major level. Well, half of these guys probably can one day. It's just there's not a lot of teams out there. There's a lot of players out there that can play this game on our level. It's just we're fortunate enough to be on those teams. And then when some of us old guys like me retire, That'll open up spots for these guys here to, to play. It's great to progress from the technical end that we presented first and to listen to the top players in the game reinforce and help you fill in the gaps on what we've failed to do previously. And it's also interesting to listen to how they too struggle, albeit at the highest end of the game, but they too have their nervousness and inconsistencies like we do. We're going to fill out this section of the video by listening to some top amateur athletes Fill in the blank on some of the other teaching things and try to help you understand different segments of it better by giving you short vignettes from several players at that level. Also, we're going to talk to some pitchers, the three best pitchers in the game at the pros, amateur, and senior level. And they're going to show you how to analyze pitchers and how to beat them at their own game. Finally, we've got some odds and ends, things like increasing bat speed, some specific training, and finally, listening to some players that have some really heavy medical problems that are going to make us understand that our aches and pains are pretty minor in comparison. We'll finish up by talking to some senior legends and visiting with the Senior Bomb Squad in Seattle and Kent, Washington. Now, Bogey wanted me to come over here and talk to you a little bit of uh, my swing and stuff. I'm, I'm not a really big guy, but I have a pretty good bat speed for my size. I pretty much try to get all my back weight on my back foot, my right foot, so I can keep all my power there. And then when I come through my zone, I always want to hit the ball out in front of the plate. Because all, all your power is going to be when you're out and extended out. You want to bust the ball out there. When I come through, all my power is coming through my back end, you know, as I'm opening up my hips. So my, my right, my, um, my front arm is pretty much just a guide as I come through. And I think get all my power from my, my right arm. If, you're, if, you just, if you don't get your wrist to come over, you're not going to get your power through here. 
you're just going to come, it's going to be a straight lag. Okay, and you're just, it's like you're just pushing the ball instead of snapping. When you come through here, you're snapping your wrist and you're snapping the bat head onto the, onto the ball and driving the ball through. So in summary, old guy, little guy, and best looking guy on the softball magazine staff, and that's why they call me Boomy. <laughs> when I won the softball magazine home run derby last year, I've, uh, I've always been a complete overlap rip hitter. And uh, I've started playing on some better tournament teams on the weekends. And you really don't get that many chances to swing anymore with the home run limits. And so what I've done is I'm one of the players that have gone back to a more of a conventional grip. Where I line up my knuckles, I drop one hand off, and I, I completely line up my knuckles. And so I'm more of a, it's closer to the baseball grip, except I, I uh, put my wrist together and line my knuckles off. And what I found with that is it gives me a lot more control. My back hip is a lot more tied to this top hand snap and, and push and pull through than it than what it used to be. My average has definitely gone up. I'm, I'm more consistent. And uh, by, by using that, that back hip to push my hands through, then I, I still have the, the ability to, to uh, cut through the bottom half of the ball and, and still hit home runs when I need to. When I try to do it, if I'm going to hit the ball, let's try and hit the ball out. What I try to do is I try to cut the bottom quarter of the ball and get a little bit of lift and a little bit of spin in order to go ahead and project it out. What I don't want to do is I don't want to change my swing to alter that to hit singles or do whatever. So I try, try to take the same swing and hit the top quarter portion of the ball to get the ball to kind of um, <clears throat> top spin over in so, order to hit singles. Um, I try to hit everything hard. If you hit it hard, good things happen. I'm only aiming for the top third, top quarter of the ball, and I'm trying to use my same swing, and I'm trying to go ahead and either hit the gap in the right center, or I'm trying to hit it through the 3-4 hole. Trying to hit it through the 3-4 with some authority, so this way if they do get a chance to get a glove on it, hopefully they have to make a good play to get it out. The reason why I, I, I use my top hand, because it's my strong hand, and also when I deliver the bat head to the ball, I feel that my right hip and my lower body, more energy to the ball and thus, you know, making my strength, making my swing stronger. Tempo of my swing is going to dictate whether I go for base hits or home runs. Probably when I try to go for base hits, since my top hand is my strongest hand, I try to slow my top hand down so I can get a little less speed behind, behind the swing, thus not creating as much spin. As you can see with the top spin on the ball, that's how I know I'm getting a good base hit. I had played uh, minor league baseball uh, as a pitcher, but still had to hit. Uh, I wasn't a particularly gifted baseball hitter, but I still have a baseball stroke. Uh, so what I uh, did was mostly inside out stuff, and I still try and hit the backside uh, as much as I can. I'm playing a lot more U-Trip, and uh, I was getting eaten up in the beginning uh, trying to time uh, quick pitching. This was my old, my old motion here. Uh, I was wide open, and when the pitch would come, I'd have to still get to that exact same spot and bring it in in order to time and get my hands ready to go. Now, the difference being is I'm ready to go from, from here. My weight is back here on the back leg. So if a, if a fastie comes through on you trip and a guy tries to quick pitch me, I'm ready to go. I got my hands back, they're dropped up, and I'm ready to go. I spent three months in Iraq with the military. Didn't have a chance to hit. Uh, Obviously, it was kind of busy. Uh, the only way I could uh, get my swings in was to visualize them or just to take dry swings. So I had a couple drills I would do in the, in the gym. I would just, just go through the swing, just you know, one part at a time, and try and work on it and, and think of what it would be like to hit. And then I would also take a, a broom handle and just hold it behind my, my back like this and try and visualize hitting the ball with the back part to try and really drive my hips through. Right after I got back, hadn't had a chance to play. There was a, a big bragging rights home run contest uh, on base. So I walked into the contest without having had any bad practice, but the visualization gave me such a clear picture of what my swing should look like and, and what it should feel like that I was able to step in there and uh, had a real good swing and won the contest without ever having taken any bad practice. Just the visualization is like I've been hitting for months, even though I hadn't had a chance to pick up a bat. Uh, another benefit of using the, the visualization is that during a tournament, uh, if my swing's gone bad, I can sit down in between games and think back to what my swing should feel like in my mind and I'm able to get back on track and get my swing back between games just using the, the visualization techniques I used while I was over in Iraq. I had an opportunity to play uh, 
part ball in the minor leagues for the Cincinnati Red organization. Both years uh, in AAA, I got hurt early on in the year, so uh, never, never tasted the coffee. I was a 300 plus hitter with uh, alley power. Influence of using my inside out baseball swing uh, allows me to wait on the ball and uh, I don't arrive early. I don't, I don't pop a lot of balls up. I, I drive a lot of balls uh, on a line hard. The, uh, in softball, it took a couple of years to learn to, to stay on the back foot and stay behind the ball. And um, I'm basically a top hand push hitter and I like the ball away from me, so I still hit the ball really well to left center, right center. Um, try, I, I try to find a pitch and I look in a box and I use my top hand and I try to drive my top hand to get the bat through the center of the ball. I really don't try to, to drive the ball up. It, it's an easy transition from, uh, from hard ball to softball to be able to hit like that. Uh, I still keep a wide, sturdy base uh, you see a lot of softball players stand with their feet together. I still have a, a wide, sturdy base, and I, I let the ball come to me, and I, I try to drive the ball um, with, flat with my top hand. The rotational theory of it is, is excellent, isn't that what we use, but even though it's a backside push, it is absolutely rotational. You've got to rotate through that ball. Your front part of your body is going to be straight. Your front leg will be straight, your front arm is straight. The back part of your body is pushing, which is your back leg, your hips will drive, and your back arm will push. What we used to demonstrate this is it's simple. There's a table right here. You've got to clear this table off. The main objective is of this, you need to be at your exact 100% bat speed prior to hitting the ball. Most people are swinging. You can hear the bat speed right here. That's after you hit the ball. You want to be at 100% prior to hitting ball, which will be this. And it's not any different. Pushing, you're pushing to the ball, and you're maintaining your push through the ball. Keep it going through, straight flat through, through the ball as long as you can. Your arm will come off because you can't reach the bat. You push on that bat right there, your wrist will come back right here. The roll which there is none until afterwards, and that's because of the release. Push at that barrel. You're maintaining it through the ball. You can't go anywhere, you're pushing. If I'm here, push at me. Your wrist, there's nothing, there's nothing I can do to stop it. Key to remember is don't just push forward to the ball, it's maintaining it through the ball. To continue to go through that ball as long as you can, keep that bat on the ball and drive through and around. If you are pushing from here, you're using your whole arm and your shoulders to do it. Your wrist will not roll over the ball. You'll maintain your speed through it. This is exactly straight. You're having a longer hammer in your hand to push with. It's like a longer driver in golf. It's here, it's extension, and it's full out, and it's through the ball, and maintains through it, and then release. Back where I live, I go hitting with a lot of the younger ball players and uh, you know, try to refine their swing. I don't like to change their swing. I just like to get them to do what they do best better. And one of the things I tell them is hit attacking the ball in front of the plate and also hitting it in a certain arc, the height wise. So the first thing I do is I come up to the plate and I draw an arc with the knob of my back. And that's the zone right there that you're supposed to hit the ball in, from the front of the plate right up into this point right here. Okay? The second part of the arc is your height. So it's going to start on the inside part of the plate right about this high and then it's gonna finish on the outside part of the plate right about chest high. So the whole point to this is hit the ball in front of the plate. You can always go down and get an inside pitch and still keep the bat east and west, which is gonna give you that good spin. A little bit higher pitch that's outside, you can really come down and collapse on it, keep your bat level and drive that ball to right, right center, right field. So anywhere a ball's pitched in this arc, there's a place to hit it. And the key to hitting it is figuring out your arc from the inside to the outside and then always out in front of this plate area. And if you're attacking the ball there, you're going to have very good success. Again, you want to hit a ball to the right side, you want that ball up a little bit higher and on the outside part of the plate. You want to drive that ball to left field, you want it on the inside part of the plate. If you get an inside pitch that's high, you've got to go get it here. Now your bat angle's wrong, you're going to get a lot of foul balls. So you want to get that inside pitch a little bit lower to keep your bat angle the right direction. So it's really simple. You just follow those two arcs and learn how to hit the ball. And the biggest key is learning how to identify where the pitch is going to be when it's halfway to the plate 
and knowing automatically in your mind what direction you're going to hit that pitch. Well, I mean, you, as a pitcher, granted, it's underhand, so you need to do anything you can to um, get the advantage. So as I'm pitching to anybody, whether it's a, a, a fun league game or a tournament, a major tournament, I'm looking at the batter of, of, of what they don't like, where they stand in the box. If Depending on where they stand in the box, I can figure out where they want the pitch, and I try not to put it there. Um, they may, they may be a sucker for high and inside pitches. They may like the high floating pitch, and they might hit that foul. In the major division, one foul, uh, after the first strike, you get no fouls. So any advantage like that that you can see a weakness that they may do, you have to take advantage of it. I mean, whatever you see, where they stand, where they like to swing, if they swing at balls. If they swing at balls, don't throw them a strike. Throw them, a close, throw them somewhere close where it looks like a strike, but it's not. It could be inside, it could be outside, it could be short, it could be deep. They just want to get there. They're squeezing the bat. They want to hit, they want to hit. Hold them in there for a while. They're so excited. Don't let them. Don't let them. Uh, don't let them just get in there and hit. Make them sit in there for a while. Get a five-second call if you have to. But anything you do to get them off balance. As a hitter, I think a lot of their mistakes and like the wreck, wreck and moving up as they move up is they have a thought in their mind. I'm going to hit this ball in the six hole. I'm going to hit this ball to right field. And no matter where the pitch is, they try to hit it there. Instead of as a hitter, you kind of got to go where the pitch is. Maybe I'm if I'm a pitcher and I know you want to go to right side, and you're standing off the plate. I'm not going to give me an outside pitch to go to the right side. So a, a lower level guy might see that inside pitch and try to inside out it, and that's not what he wants to do. He wants to go to the right side, but he wants an outside pitch, but he's so focused on hitting it there, his mind's made up no matter where the pitch is, I'm going to hit it there, and that's a big mistake. You, you might have an idea where you want to hit it, but if the pitcher doesn't give, the, give you that pitch, make an adjustment and hit it where the pitch is thrown. Yeah, there's no doubt. If, if, I, if I'm reading you, if I'm reading a hitter, he should be looking at me. Maybe I pump one, pump two, and then throw the third one. If you don't pay attention, you might not know that. But if I get into a, a force of habit where I'm always pumping once, then throwing, or always pumping twice, then throwing, or I might take one step at you, back up, and throw it, I may not even know I'm doing this continuously, but you need to, you need to look at what I'm doing, too. Personally, I try hardly ever to throw a four-seamer. If it's 3-1, we start a 1-1 count, so you throw, you know, a ball 2-1, ball 3-1. I'm probably, if it's early in the game, I'm still throwing a knuckleball. If I walk him, I walk him. I'm not going to just let him sit there and sit on a four-seam uh, cookie and just hit it. Knuckleball is my bread and butter pitch. I like to use it 80% of the times. I see all the pitchers they have tendencies of throwing a knuckleball real close like this with the fingers and tight. This gives allowances for if it slips out of the hand. It can go left or it can go right. I like to grab it like this, right on top of the seams, use my pinky as a guy, my thumb as a guy, because when I pitch, I'm throwing out, and this locks the ball in. When I lock the ball in, the only way for that ball to go is straight out of my hand. There's certain indicators that you would be able to check, pick up on a pitcher, because if you know he's falling back or he's off balance, more times than not, that, that pitch is going to come short. If a pitcher's standing over the plate, over the pitcher's mount, and he throws it, you're going to be seeing something that's coming across your chest. The guy that stands fast, the guy that stands fast, he looks confident in the mound. He takes his time. He sets up. He gets himself ready. I have to wait for him as a pitcher. Me as a batter, I want to make sure that the pitcher knows that I'm ready for whatever he throws, whether it's a knuckleball, curveball, straight pitch, or smooth ball. Those are the main four pitches that are out there these days. Um, by far, Andy, Andy Purcell has our best knuckleball. Uh, scouting, very important. You get a chance to go to a tournament, you know, you're, you're there for softball, you guys aren't playing for a couple hours. What are we going to do? Go watch the pitchers you're going to face because their rhythms and patterns will show up whenever they pitch. And just watch them and see, oh my gosh, uh, he was 2-0 and there, that's the pitch he threw. He's probably going to do that to me. You know something? You're right, and you'll be ready to hit him when you see him. Most pitchers have a rhythm just like batters, and you can learn their rhythm the way the pitchers are trying to learn yours. Isn't this fa what a great game back and forth? Toughest pitch to hit in softball, bar none, is a knuckleball. Late breaking, unpredictable movement. Nobody likes it. Uh, the way to beat it, or the best way to prepare it against it, is to not pay attention to it. Don't do it show with your body expression, oh my God, what did that ball just do? The pitcher will eat you up because he knows you don't like it. So if you see a pitch that looks stupid, just don't react to it. Don't give him an advantage to say, I'll throw this pitch every time at the guy. He's probably going to come back with a fastball or a straight ball, especially if you do that first knuckleball for a ball. Don't give in to the pitcher. Don't let him know what you're really thinking because the real good ones will work you to death. Hey, a good example of an asshole pitcher is the guy that comes out to the mound, fires one that's obviously low, three feet, and then the umpire calls it illegal, and he takes two and a half minutes arguing uh, with the call. That's all for you.
There's nobody that's that nuts. They're doing it as an act to get into your head, to break down your rhythm, to get you off your game. Remember, pitchers are trying to do that. They're looking for any edge they can. And a lot of times it comes with personality. Uh, using their personality to affect your personality. Don't let them do it. You can't hit enough bat in practice. That's why there's no need to roll or vice bats. You speed up the process of them breaking that way. Do it in bat in practice. You get to get your skills honed and your skills better as you go. And when you get down to that clutch situation when the game is on the line, all that bat in practice is going to pay off. You're going to be relaxed. You're going to kill it. You're going to win a championship for your buddies. Ray DeMarini is also responsible for putting a rotation index on a bat, number one to eight. And this system is designed to where it's two, a quarter of an inch spread around a two and a quarter inch diameter bat gives you eight different spots to hit. And that's how much space the ball takes between each number. And that's how much the ball lays into the bat for the normal batter. And this rotation index will increase the life of your bat if used properly at least two times. It will last twice as long if you rotate it compared to as if you don't rotate it. Um, what it does is it spreads the hits around the barrel of the bat instead of hitting the same spot. It also, on composite bats, breaks the bat in faster, better all the way around so you have consistent hot spot on the barrel no matter where you hit it. So the way it works is you take the number one, line it up between the thumb and index finger of your top hand visually, hit a ball, and on the next hit you should be lined up on the number two between the thumb and index finger of your top hand. We at Kelly Sports have been telling people on the phone this for years and showing them this as much as we can out in the field. Uh, again, it makes your bat hotter, makes it last longer, and gives you confidence to swing it. In a game, you're probably not going to remember to rotate it, but if you've done it enough in batting practice, it will be broken in, and no matter where you hit it, it's going to not let you down. It's going to be hot. So that's the uh, Ray DeMarini invention. We put it on wide out on our bats and we use we do it this way because he's got a patent on it and no other bat company can put it on their bats but you guys can go buy a two dollar wide out marker and do it yourself and uh, I won't have to sell you another bat for quite a while it'll last you that much longer we'd like that better safety first in order to hit all pitches and go to all fields it is absolutely necessary to have a pitching screen Ken and Brett used to hit without one until one day at the park. That's a good one, boys. Take a look at that. <laughs> look at that thing. My own kid did that to me. The ultimate in portability and safety is the pitching screen by PitchSafe. What an incredibly simple and effective product that is lightweight but strong and travels well. We have seen these nationally from Florida to Phoenix, and it's an investment for live BP that you literally can't live without. Okay, the economy's got us all down. You don't have money for a lot of equipment. You don't have a batting cage at your availability. And you need to practice indoors. You can do so by making a poor man's batting cage. You got your last two pair of socks out. You wind them up. You wrap them together. And I'll tell you what, when you get done, this thing's not going to win me any money at the Belmont Craft Fair. There's enough mass to it that you can take a full swing with a regular weighted bat. And the impact of it hitting anything is very minimal. Better than hitting off a tee or a wiffle ball. Helps me get my timing down. She really can knock your socks off. The virtual hitting cage simply involves having videotape of a pitcher from the batter's viewpoint. Then show it on a TV and you'll find that you can use a short cut off bat and you'll be able to time and get used to swinging at the pitches as they come towards you. It's really a great tool for getting used to U-trip and fakes and to develop good timing and hip rotation. Since it does tend to make you look forward towards the TV, make sure that you drive the ball up and get used to slugging some bombs off of Guido, Joe, and even Andy Purcell. It's pretty realistic. Helps me with my timing and to watch where I actually follow through. Come on, Purcell, you're mine. <laughs> Trying to sit back here, hands back here, and just try to wind and push up through, push up through. In this session where I was trying to hit for power, 
I personally must over-exaggerate driving the ball up at a 45 degree angle just to get a slight upswing and drive the ball without lunging. That's really punching the bat head through. You can see the angle I was attempting to swing up at and where I actually ended up swinging. Didn't extend. Actually false. I extended, but I hit the ball too far out in front. I needed to let it come back to me to a better point of contact. Oh, didn't extend. This is true. I stopped extending my top arm at impact. I just lost the focus. And the bat head did not rise up on the oversnap. Thus, the snap died of contact and a weak cleave on the bottom of the ball. The one thing you've got to understand as you try to implement this program is be ready for frustrations. And lots of times you get worse before you get better because you have preconceived biases and you only listen to things that you want to hear. Hopefully we've given you a good base to start out with. We make mistakes to hitters. There's mistakes in this video. The pros don't always relate. The English language is a hard thing to use to try to make somebody feel something that you have to learn how to feel. You have to learn to feel the swing. You have to learn the feel of where the ball is back here. And then you have to trust. You can't go into a game and say, man, that was so easy in BP, then all of a sudden the game is diff it's different. And lots of times it's different because you're placing the ball and pitching the ball in different spots. Uh, really the last key, those three simple things that we talked about, wind and time, quick step swing, those are easy. And to think to push and extend the top hand through with the bat head and to aim that way, that's easy. But the hard part becomes in games for a lot of people is pitching the ball in the right spot, letting it come back to you. So if you can relax, take a deep breath, and focus on letting the ball drop into here. Maybe you don't pick up the pitch until it's halfway back to you. Things like that are going to help you get better. But there will be frustrations, and you have to trust that the technique that you do in BP, if you use one of these four focuses, if you use this technique and you do awesome in BP off a tee, you progress on, you know that it's right and you have to trust that. You can't be changing back to an old style or an old technique that you used years ago and all of a sudden expect to have success. You've got to trust you can hang with this technique and that then it's a matter of learning the timing and learning how to look for the right pitch. And that carries on into batting practice. If you have good pitch selection and batting practice and videotape yourself and understand where your zone is, you'll develop a feel for it. One thing is when teammates offer advice, understand that they might not have researched it as much as you. And listen politely and, you know, certainly there will be things that they offer that are good, but make sure that your decisions on changing your swing and your pitch selection are on sound um, scientific things that you've studied yourself through videotape and from analyzing tape of good hitters. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about the grip. I use a full overlap grip with the finger at the bottom. I think that I can go opposite field as easy as I can with the top hand. I've used this for so long that I feel uncomfortable going back to a conventional group. But the greatest hitters in the game, Bumgarner, Hall, McCraw, they all use, drop a little finger and use a conventional baseball grip. And it has to do with you get a a lot of hand on the bat, you get a good push off it. Dan Reed went back to it, so I don't think a grip is something that is that important. It's something you can play around with, but it doesn't affect the other mechanics in your swing. It takes the determination to consistently drill this stuff until it becomes good muscle memory, and then it takes trust to get up and understand that the mechanics are good. I stopped reading fast pitch forms a couple years ago because about three years ago or four years ago, a big term came out, rotational hitting. And we use it too, and it's nonsense. I use it because of the hype in it. But basically, if you think about it, our swing is a natural power swing. If you go to YouTube, it's the same swing Babe Ruth had, Ted Williams had. It's the same for fast pitch, baseball, and slow pitch in the, in the base terms of it. And really, if you think about it once, your main first move is to wind the hips. as you, Okay, that's rotational. But your body is drifting forward. Is that not linear? Your front foot comes down hard. That's linear. But then it's driven down and planted by the rotation, which is rotational. The hands come forward, you could say, which is linear. But by watching our overheads, you can see they're following the arc of the body opening. They aren't truly straight forward. And so that's rotational. And when you get to this point here, the wrists rotate around, uh, the bat head rather rotates around the wrist. Again, it's rotational. So don't waste your time on nonsense like that. Instead, worry about more important things like how to build your flexibility, how to get stronger, how to improve your bat speed. If you go to Mike Masenko's website at Big Cat 844, he's got a bat speed drill program, which is pretty awesome, and guys have had great luck with it. 
Mike's got a lot of other great things on there, including a video that he did a few years ago that I enjoyed. Mike's program works you twice a week with a light bat, your normal bat, and a heavier bat. And it stimulates the slow twitch and the fast twitch fibers. And it's an awesome program. The only thing, again, we don't like you to swing full go without hitting some resistance because we want you to emphasize your proper point of contact. And uh, we are afraid that if you don't swing uh, with resistance of hitting the tee, hitting the mule bag, hitting a hanging piece of carpet, you have a piece of ship rope, anything, that you're going to end up having a point of contact out here. We had a bad speed meter that we used, but we didn't particularly like it because we found ourselves swinging with different mechanics to try to get our bad head to go faster. So we would rather work on hitting off a tee, hitting live, hitting soft toss, and really working on getting the mass of the body behind the swing so that there's less recoil on the bat and it blasts through the ball with a more efficiency and you carry more of your mass of the body into the bat head and through the ball. I feel confident because we are rec players. I never played nationally until I was 50 and that was seniors. And I feel the mechanics that we're teaching, we've tested out, it's worked for us and it's gonna work for you. In the last six months since I've turned 55, I was lucky enough to, for the first time in my life, win the 55 Young Man Home Run Contest at Wanafest last July. In February, I won the Tournament of Champions uh, 50 Division Home Run Contest. And then a couple months later, I beat 54 young guys in the Softball Magazine Spring Training Contest. I'm far from being in the elite group of hitters nationally. I'm, I'm a good senior major power hitter. But basically, it shows where somebody who doesn't even take a glove to tournaments, me, can go and learn mechanics and, and improve the game enough that you can play at a higher level than you ever dreamt of. Well, diabetes is a, a tough disease to have. I found out in uh, 1987, June 1st, uh, that I had it. I was gaining weight and uh, ballooned up to 259. Uh, found out, uh, went on a diet. They thought I was type 2 diabetic and by the time August rolled around, I was down to about 150 pounds. I lost 100 pounds, and then they figured it out that I had juvenile uh, diabetes. So, you know, it was insulin. I didn't want to go on it, but once I got on it, I felt better. And then uh, there's more and more technology coming up. I'm on a Paradigm pump right now. And uh, it's a disease you can live with, but every day you can't forget you have it because. Uh, you know, it, it can be crippling and the horror stories that you hear can happen to you. So I try to behave most of the time. I work out so I can uh, still play ball and I love being around softball players. So it's, uh, it's a disease I wish I didn't have. I just got married and had uh, two kids and it was uh, devastating at first, but you know, exercise and the right diet and uh, you, you can learn to live with it. There's a lot of temptations at the park. Uh, I used to drink a lot of beer with the boys when I played when I was uh, first out of college. But, you know, and the fried hamburgers, I'll have a hamburger maybe once every two weeks. And I, I love pizza, but I have veggie pizza and thin crust. And, uh, you know, the temptations are there all the time. You got to pack sandwiches and pack good food. Don't feel like you got to stop playing. You can play many years. Uh, about, I played 21 since 87 and it, it's something I want to keep playing. You know, as long as I'm still here, I'm going to try to play uh, softball as long as I can. Dave Curry from Saginaw, Michigan. As you see right here, last November had a hip replacement and about four months after that, I was actually swinging a bat. And before the replacement, I was having pain because there's no cartilage and I was bone on bone. And then as soon as I had the hip replacement, all the pain was gone. So don't ever have to fear of getting a hip replacement. I'm 39, you may be older, but have no qualms about going in and getting it done. I just highly recommend having it done. I'm out here with Ken today. He's giving me some batting tips and already seeing some improvement. I, I suggest work real hard on all the surrounding core muscles, hip flexor, hammies, quads, get that all straightened up. But after that, you're, you'll be better than you were because you have no pain and you rebuild all your muscles. One of the things Ken was showing me today is I've probably lost a lot of my cartilage because I'll get on the, I'll put on, the, start with all my weight on the back and I leave it there and I'm rotating all on my back hip and that probably really dis, disintegrate a lot of the cartilage. Look at all the weights off. There's no pressure on my hip anymore. It's all up here, which is my good hip. When I was 18, I uh, poked my left eye with a cable cord 
lost uh, vision in it. The biggest uh, problem I had was the depth perception, seeing the ball, um, learning to judge the ball differently than you had in the past because it, you don't catch it as easy and see it as easy as everybody else. I did it uh, in the winter of the year. I lost the vision in my eye and continued to play on until the next season and it's when I really uh, taught myself how to be a better hitter um, to actually take advantage of weaknesses in fields and learn to hit to more all the fields. With it being my left eye and me being a right-handed batter I find it easier to uh, catch the ball deeper in my stance to go to the right side. Um, you have to open up a lot more in order to catch the flight of the ball from the pitcher. Uh, it probably took me a good couple years to actually learn uh, the depth perception back and to regain that confidence. I had a couple weekends where I hit over 800 at a national tournament this last year. Uh, we finished in the top 15. No matter what element you got, you can do it. Uh, just stick with it, keep plugging away at it, and it'll come back. It just takes a lot of practice. Three of the best hitters ever in the young men's super major game are now seniors. Let's begin our senior salute by paying them a visit. We've done the, the, the ultimate tape with Ray in 94, 93, 94. You know, I could just step in the box and go to whacking. It didn't make a difference. They killed it from the get-go. But what I found out as I got older, it takes, for me, it takes me, I'm a really, I use my legs and my hips a lot. You know, so what things I end up learning how to do, I, I had to do was get my legs loose before I came in and started taking my BP. I would always go out and work on some fielding 15, 20 minutes before I come in and take BP, especially before we play the game. Until I got my legs loose, a lot of times you see me taking BP, you see me missing a lot of balls, down the ground balls, but not really driving the ball, just kind of put a good swing on it because everything's not in, in timing, it's not working together until everything gets loose. When I focused on this shoulder going to the ball, for me, the power side is my left side. When I'm thinking straight away, and I'm keeping everything going to the ball, as long as I can hold it in and let my hands do the work, take that knob right to the ball, and let my hands do the work the rest of the way, that's when I'm hitting my best. But I'm focusing on letting the ball get to a point, letting it get in on me. When you, when you think straight away, what that does is keeps everything to the ball. You catch a lot of guys, they might be thinking poor, they might be thinking straight away, but the ball ends up coming in and you catch them, they're opening up real quick. For me, my power was gone, okay? I mean, I could still hit it hard with the right side, but the difference for me was right side hit 320. Left side threw the ball 450. So my biggest focus was keeping the head on, keep that head real still. Head right on the ball, front shoulder to the ball, as long as you can hold it there and let them hands do the work. And you, you, you won't believe how much more power you hit for power. I, I always aim at the middle of the ball. I never, whenever I tried to hit the, <laughs> Uh, spin the ball like Dirk Androff, he spun the ball better than anybody I ever knew. That didn't work for Larry Carter. Larry Carter learned how to come through the ball and drive the ball to get a trajectory here. Because playing in Oklahoma, we all know the wind blows 30, 40 miles an hour. There was games that we played, the wind was going straight in. You spin the ball, and it might go out to short left center, it might come back to the plate, back home. So. That one thing I learned to do was just aim at the middle of the ball and throw those hands through the middle of the ball because when you're catching the ball at the right height that you know is right for you, when you catch it right and let it get to you, your trajectory is like you want it. That's why when I catch a ball here, right there, that's my spot right there. When I catch it here and it's up here, all I got to do is put my regular swing on it in the middle of the ball and I'm getting a ball that's going through the lights. I taught myself everything I know about hitting. I, uh, I was misfortunate. I never really got coaching like some of these other guys that play triple-a baseball and you got the hands you can become a one hell of a hitter with that teaching behind you but i've never got that everything i learned i taught myself by like david Rennie, you, gotta, you gotta have a passion to be good whatever i wanted whenever i went to a tournament i wanted to be the best one there when, when people left that tournament i i, I wanted to imagine them on a the plane said man did you see that ball there in both games not one game in both games you see how far he hit that ball I wanted to be that guy people would talk about when they went home. That made me work at it, work at it, work at it, work at it. You know, with me, I was always strong upper body, but I was I never wanted to be one of those guys running around with the sleeves up, showing everything off. That ain't why I was in the gym. I was in the gym to improve my game out here. The one thing I worked the most and worked faithfully no matter what, the legs. Right here, the legs. I worked my legs twice a week in between doing cardio 
And I played the outfield at 290 pounds in a three-man outfield, and we played mostly on the big field, so I had to do a lot of running. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to go out there if I wasn't in shape, because when you lose your legs, you're going to lose your hands at the plate. You can't get your hands through the ball if you don't have your legs down. And these got to work first before these work. In between sets, because it's going to work your hands, it's going to work that. I ain't going to say it because the kids might be watching this, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Get your exercise ball, put it on the middle of your back. Get your 45-pound plate or 25. Just start with a 25 till you get used to it. Put them up on your chest. Lean back on the ball, and you want to do a little short, abbreviated squats. Now do this probably 15 times in between your sets that you're doing of your weightlifting. And I guarantee you, you do that with some cardio. And on your cardio, the thing is, especially as an outfitter, what I used to do is get on the bike, I ride for five minutes at level four, level five. I would, after five minutes, I would kick it up to like level eight. And from level eight, every 30 seconds, I would go from, I would go from level eight to level 12 for 30 seconds, hard as I can, bring it back down to level eight, let it smooth out for 30 seconds, put it back up to 12, 30 seconds, because that's the way you play, especially as an outfielder. You don't play like a, like a, 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 a bike rider, you know, just like one consistent movement. You go up and down. You ride the bike that way, I guarantee you're gonna be a, your legs will be a lot stronger for you in the outfield when you're playing these tournaments. Try those exercises, and I guarantee you they work for you. They worked for me in many years, and they're still working. The LC Legend, which is my signature model, came out uh, actually in September of last year. I told them I like the steel handle and the composite barrel. They made it, and look where it's I tell you what, I hit two balls in the 40 and overworld. I hit most of uh, two of them that they could only walk and count them at 534 because the trees, it hit it three quarters ways up the trees, and they couldn't walk in the woods anymore. Don Clatterball is a rare hitter who's been a star in both the Young Men's Super Major as well as in the Senior Major Plus divisions. Many consider him the finest all-around hitter in senior softball. Still in outstanding shape in his early 60s, this ASA Hall of Famer spent some time with us last year and shared these stories. Bogey asked me what my hottest streaks were in softball, and, and two years ago uh, we had a stretch of four tournaments in a row and I had 82 straight hits. We went to the Huntsman's games. I made it out the first two times up in, I mean, first time up in that game, the first game, and then had 13 straight hits after that. So I had one out and like 90 sometimes at bat when 82 straight. At the beginning of the 2007 season with uh, my Spicer turn two team, the first two weekends, I was uh, a perfect at 1,000. I was uh, 67 for 67 after the first two tournaments. And now I'm down to dying 17, so the coach wants to know why I'm slumping. My two keys are, first of all, you want to hit a strike, and you want to try to hit the ball square in the middle. If you hit the ball square in the middle, you're going to hit a line drive. Nobody's going to hit it square in the middle every time you swing at it. And when I don't hit it square in the middle, I hit underneath of it a little bit, and I get it good, it's going to go over the fence. If I hit it in a gap somewhere, it's going to be extra bases. But you got to make sure you have a, you know, a balanced stance, Make sure that you step up to the plate, a positive-minded, pick out a pitch that you can handle, and try to hit that ball dead in the center. I'm looking for a pitch that's about mid-thigh to the letters. And if I get a pitch in that area, I'm trying to hold back my weight on the back foot and I explode into the ball, hit the ball out front of the plate. If this is the front of the plate, I want to meet that ball right here. I don't want to let it get back behind me. I don't want to hit it out here, but I want to get it right at the front edge of the plate and try to break the ball in two pieces. All right, my bread and butter in hitting a slow pitch softball is in the middle of the field. Uh, I do not pull the ball very often. I stand off the plate. I'm looking for a pitch that's middle to me on the plate. I do not want to hit a ball inside. If they throw it inside off the plate and I swing at it, then I swing at a bad pitch. And I will have to pull that pitch. I'm, I'm better off hitting it from left center to right center and I've lived in that area for about 30, 40 years now. That's my bread and butter right there. Don't get in the habit of a lot of bat movement. I mean, I've seen a lot of hitters when they're in the batter's box in, that bat's doing all this right here, and then they gotta stop that before they can swing at it. I want the bat still, I want it back, I want it right at the level of my shoulders, and I wanna have flexibility in my knees and my legs to go after the ball. The thing you don't do is drop Ooh. your hands to the pitch. You drop your body to the pitch. If that ball is down near my waist and I do this, I've, I've hit the ball in the air, probably with nothing on it. But if it's down at my waist and I do this, I'm down there at the level with it, 
then that ball the home run, but it's going to be something somebody don't want to mess with. Because when you come through that ball, you want to snap those wrists through and bring that, that bottom hand through. Well, a lot of my regiment that we do is uh, we lift weights three days a week. We hit softballs four days a week. I'm lifting weights Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm hitting softballs Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, unless I'm in a tournament. Now, it doesn't just happen. You got to get in that weight room. You got to make yourself stronger. Your upper body, you gotta do some flexibility work with, with your body so that you are flexible when you hit also. Flexibility is probably your number two fitness ingredient. Strength is number one, but flexibility is number two. Oh. Now when I'm going to hit the ball up the middle of the field, the intent is to miss the pitcher. You don't want to hit the ball through the pitcher because if you hit through the pitcher, two bad things happen. He catches it, gets you out, and you may hurt him. So if I go through the middle, I'm going with the intention of three or four feet to the side of him, or three or four feet over his head in the center field. Well, I play on some young teams also, and uh, the thing that really distresses me the most about the younger players coming up today is that they think alcohol, tobacco, drugs, steroids, and all that's part of softball. And I've never done any of those things. Uh, I'm totally against it. I feel if you want to be strong, get in the gym and be strong. Uh, steroids is not the solution. Alcohol is not associated with softball. I mean, people do it, but it's the worst thing that an athlete can do to abuse his body if he has visions of having any kind of longevity in the sport. So this is my 40th year of softball, and I think some of that has to be the reason. I mean, the way I've lived, the way my lifestyle is, my work regimen, uh, how much I hit, I think all that comes into play and allows me to be able to, to keep playing this game at a high level. I took one of my students back when I was teaching school and brought him out to a league game one night. Well, we're playing this pretty good team and I was all pumped up to play and I popped up the first time up and I popped up the second time up and she sent the kid down to the dugout with a quarter. And she said, Miss Clatterbaugh said, give you this quarter so you can buy yourself a hit. Well, I put it in my pocket, you know, bit my tongue and went on. Next time up, I popped up a third time. She sent the same kid down with a dollar. She said, buy yourself a hit. And the fourth time I popped up, she sent him with the credit card. She said, charge yourself a hit. And that's how the credit card story got going. As a young man growing up in the 1980s, Mike Masenka was my idol. I saw the Steel's barnstorming teams play, and they were so over the top better than anyone else that it was freaky. Mike set the national records of 844 and 830 home runs in back-to-back -back years and is considered by myself and many others the greatest power hitter ever in that era that featured unlimited home runs. He's also an outstanding person, a great spokesman for softball, and one that I'm proud to call a friend. In 1995 or so, playing on a D team in a major tournament in Milwaukee, we faced Richard Superior, the best super major team in the world, and Mighty Mike was catching. I really wanted to impress Mike, and that awesome at bat still lives vividly in my memory. Bogey, hit it out of here. Oh, Bogey! That's the whole key. You want to catch that pitch from there to there. You know, I've seen guys take too many swings. I've seen a guy one time take 100 and some before the game. Now, at midnight, I, I thought that was a little too many, but... <laughs> I, I quit the game uh, at probably an early age. Uh, at the time when I quit, uh, I had to uh, financially for my family, so I quit when I was 41 years old. And at the time, I, uh, I, I could still play the game real, real well, uh, but I felt that my family was more important, so I, I quit playing the game at that time. Uh, and during the next eight, nine, ten years, uh, my desire to play the game diminished. Uh, I just didn't, uh, it, it didn't bother me at all. The, to not even be around the softball field. And uh, and I guess it's maybe because I played so much. I'm not sure, but all I know is in the last couple of years, I've gotten that itch again. Uh, I enjoy being out at the ball field with the people. Uh, I enjoy hitting again. One of the things that, that happened during that eight, nine year period stretch there uh, is I let myself go physically. And uh, that's been the toughest part uh, of, of, of it all is uh, actually getting back into the gym and really working hard at it. Uh, to get myself where I can uh, go out and uh, play and not be embarrassed, you know, go out and, and feel comfortable with myself. So uh, I was talking to Kevin today, and a great 
term that you could say is uh, what Mr. Neal would used to say to me about some other players is, uh, you know, you got to reinvent yourself. So I've kind of tried to reinvent myself here in the last six months of working out hard at the gym. I've dropped about 40 pounds. Uh, down to 330 uh, from 380, so, uh, you know, I feel much better, and I still want to lose another 30 pounds, so uh, if, I, if I lose the 30 pounds uh, by the first of the year, which I'm planning on doing, uh, I'm going to probably play some senior ball next year with uh, Shelly Hoffman's team and, um, you know, enjoy the game again because I, I just, you know, you have that desire to play again, and, the, you know, you have to have that desire to get on that field and want to compete, so. Uh, I've got that taste back in my mouth, and so there's a couple of things you got to do to be able to go out there and perform at the at the best level that you can. I've cut down on the milk and the bread. Watch what I eat. Uh, I really never ever had any problems with my legs. That was my strong point. Uh, so uh, my knees I never had any problems with. So it, it's uh, it's helped me back with the riding the uh, treadmill with cardio. You know, the older you get, you got to let your body rest a little bit more. So, but I am lifting heavy and I'm doing a lot of reps, and then I'll go with light weights and do a lot of reps because I'm also trying to trim the fat up. So the, the, the one thing that I learned here out of it all with the lifting and the cardio is that uh, I do my cardio after I lift, and it seems to burn more fat. Now, I've read that, to, so you know, I have the proof to back it up in the muscle fitness magazines that say, you know, go and lift heavy, go ahead and lift your weights, and then do your cardio afterwards, and you're going to burn the fat off faster. My power, power ultimately comes from my, from my lower part of my trunk, my legs, okay? So when, you, when you're driving off that back leg, when you put all your weight, the majority of your weight, you don't want to have it all back there, so you're tipping over. But I'll tell guys to put their foot on a tippy toe so that you have that weight on the back leg. And then the back leg, and then you got your bat back here, so when you make your initial swing towards the bat, ball, you know, you, you're, you're using your front arm as your guide arm, but as, as you're going, you know, where, where my hands are at, you'll hear guys say, throw the head at the ball. And what they mean is, is, is like throw your hands at the ball. So the ball's coming in, my hands are here, I'm throwing them at the ball this way. And then as I go through, my back arm is what powers your swing to roll the wrist over, to get the good spin on the ball. Here to there, you know what I mean? Boom, boom. So what I want to do is I want to concentrate on pushing off my back leg and as I, as I swing at the ball, I want to push with my backhand through the ball. You can get in bad habits where you're pulling the ball too much, and the next thing you know, you're falling out, you're hitting foul balls. And really, that's why they call it the power alley. Right center, left center. My best shots are toward right center field. Okay, every now and then you'll hit a long one down the line, but you know, when you, when you start trying to pull too much, what happens is, is your head goes out. It's just, it's just part of the swing. Your head will go out when you're trying to pull the ball too much. So that's why you want to hit the ball to right center field, so you keep your head down on the ball. I tell people when they're struggling, say you're, you're made five, six outs in a row. The best place to hit the ball to get back on track is at the middle of the field. Reason being is because now your head's got to stay down on the ball to hit the ball to the middle of the field. You're not going to hit the ball to the middle of the field and be like this, okay? That's what happens when you pull the ball and you pull too much. So if you're going to hit the ball back to the toward middle of the field and get yourself back on track, you know, you're, you're going to stay down on the ball longer and watch it off your back. Back when we were playing with the Steels and doing the barnstorming, uh, we had gotten beat a couple of times by some local all-star teams. And the one way to correct that so that we made sure that we didn't lose again to a local all-star team, Mr. Neal said we couldn't hit home runs until we got 11 runs. So at that time, we would, would take backside pitches. We'd hit an outside pitch and try to slap it towards left field. Or if you're a right-handed uh, right batter, you want to slap it back right to right field or hit it up the middle for base hits. You're trying to hit the ball down. So, you know, you, you'll, you'll see a different swing than your normal power swing. You know what I mean? You'll move your feet in the box. You know, you're trying to make good contact so you hit the ball through the field somewhere. When you're trying for that power zone, you know, you want to hit for power, you know, you're going to go back to the basics, back leg drive, get your arms out extended, push with your back hand, pull with the front hand. Now that went over the fence, didn't it? Okay, now I missed the shit out of that ball. That's how I tell a good bat. You miss it bad and it still goes over, you got a good bat. It's a new senior gear bat that 
we came out with an anaconda. And it has my signature on it, and uh, I'm uh, very proud to uh, promote this bat. I think it's a great, it's a great bat. But, uh, definitely, the senior gear definitely is a stiff bat. Uh, that's why we put this uh, gear technology in there to make the bat stiffer, to make the bat more durable. Okay, and that's uh, one of the things that we worked on here, and uh, so far so good. So, like I said, you know, uh, Ultra Two has uh, made the standard. Uh, we've jumped into the into the market with them, and. Uh, like you said, we're trying to provide the best possible equipment for senior softball. And I think I'm better looking and twice as smart. They're funny. They're incredible. They are old. They are the senior studs. I got that running up from playing stickball in New York. <laughs> stickball. You know, that's what we do in New York. Understand our footage is limited and that we don't have video of all the great seniors nationally, but we do have a representation to show you just how awesome these guys are and how great their game is. Senior Softball USA. The SS USA is the predominant organization in senior softball and has created a tremendous forum and arena for softball for those men and women 40 and older. They have a marvelous website including a message board for the players, a tournament list with results and brackets, and they put out an outstanding quarterly newspaper sent to all the members. They offer an incredible agenda of regional, national, and world championships, separated by five-year age increments and by skill levels in each age group. Divisions run all the way into the 80s. Dave and Fran Dowell are awesome. They run these tournaments and their dedication to the seniors is unwavering. Fran was recently honored by Sports Event Magazine. 20 years ago when we started this business, we had no idea of the growth that it would have. Uh, this is awesome to have this many seniors have the ability to go out and play softball and do exactly what their passion is. To have people be able to follow their passion and be able to bring their families here and make it a real vacation is something that senior softball is very proud of. We had about 10,000 people that showed up for this tournament. 80s are ambassadors of softball. We had six 80s teams from all over the country. Uh, they were just absolutely an inspiration to all of us. And the young guys don't have to worry about getting old. You just have to worry about getting better. Other senior organizations promote senior softball and enhance the experience on a national level. Bogies Roberts Construction, now a 55 major team, have enjoyed playing SSUSA events in Seattle, Chicago, North Carolina, Phoenix, among many others. The good times and strong friendships that go hand in hand with softball absolutely don't have to end as you reach 40. Bill and Susan Ruth host SSUSA overseas softball travel tournaments to places like Japan and Italy. And everyone who wins a TOC event gets the chance to play in the SSUSA Tournament of Champions in Lakeland, Florida. It's held in January. Absolutely four days of first class softball, banquets, and camaraderie. This is the third annual Tournament of Champions, which is the most elite event of senior softball teams playing in this event have to actually win a regional, national, or world championship in order to be invited. So this is the most prestigious event of the year, and this year we've added two days of special events for those players, for the champions coming in. Uh, right now what we're doing is we're doing some uh, pitching contests, uh, some running contests, a home run contest, and a precision hitting contest. Uh, a little later today we're going to have a mini tournament. Yesterday we had an all-star game and we had a hitting clinic uh, first thing yesterday morning uh, where some of the best hitters in the country uh, helped hitters uh, give them individual instructions. Then on Friday the tournament starts and the tournament is with about 70 teams this year uh, and they will play for three days here in Florida and the winners will be the champions of champions. Incredible is the term most young guys use when they see this crop of senior hitters. Injuries and age diminish the speed and arm strength. The remaining hair turns gray, but the last skill to leave an athlete is the use of a tool, the softball bat. Whether they are masters at base hitting or have enough oomph to put the ball out of the park, we have been honored to have some outstanding senior hitters help us on this video. A few of the Bombers will show their skills in Seattle in a moment, but first, let's salute a few more nationally. First stop is the 50-plus member, Woodlawn Hitting Club. 
You have seen clips of many of them in this video. They meet every Tuesday and Thursday, year-round at the St. Petersburg location. They hit from 8 until 10.30, then go to El Tanapa for lunch. You guys that are 35 years old, think you're old, you're only halfway there, baby. Come on down, life begins at 70. Ren Williams is a powerful 72-year-old who puts the young kids to shame. What power! Right down the gulf is the kids and cubs. You have to be at least 75 to be considered a member. I'm Winchell Smith. I'm president of Kids and Cubs. I've been president for two years now. We've been in existence for 77 years. We have a bat girl. She's uh, 91 years old. She's been with the organization about 30 years. And uh, she, she's very valuable to us. We start at 75, and we have two players that go all the way up to 95. Pat Riley is 90. Pat Riley's 96 now, and he still plays, he bats, and he runs. You have to come out here and try out. We require you to run the bases in, in a given time. You have to be able to throw from base to base. You have to be able to hit the ball and uh, be able to be a pretty good catcher. Softball is. Softball is the greatest game now. My name is Harold Dean. I'm 80 years old and I play softball three days a week. Uh, my softball buddies keep hassling me because I can only play ball three days a week. However, I play hockey three days a week, uh, leaving me only one day to relax. A regular season starts in November and ends in April, but we play all year round. One of the people I watched when I was uh, in my younger days was Mickey Mantle. And uh, he had good bat speed, and uh, my father wanted me to be a, a ball player, and I watched Mickey, and uh, I took a lot of pointers from him. Florida Half Century features amazing teams. The Hollises are national powers. And of course, Georgia's Bruce Fairchild only gets better with age. The villages near Orlando host their own softball complex with over 200 teams and nine softball fields. As we move up the East Coast, a 50s slugger who has the power Stump has always dreamed of is Billy from the World Champion Sweet Construction. Near Manhattan, it's Bob Richards of the New York Statesman. Bob is a senior Hall of Famer in his 60s and incredibly beat out 55 young studs in the 2009 softball magazine base hitting contest, including his own son Puma an amazing achievement showing how experience and technique can overcome 40 years of youth. Moving further west, Geckel Construction is a 50 major plus powerhouse, and it's unbelievable that just a couple of years removed from being on the long haul Bomber Stadium tour, Bob Waldike is now a 50 year old senior slugger. He even has his own instructional DVD on softball 360, and he looks and hits like he's 35 with other big sluggers. Geckles are the docks of long ball hitting. In Minneapolis, both Docks Greyhounds, Team Mikan, and Plug swing the bats like Paul Bunyan's axe. In the Midwest, one of the members of the original 1970s Milwaukee Pro Softball team is Paulie Wenzel. He is one of the most complete players nationally, hitting for power, average, and fielding any position. If he only played full time for Roberts, he'd have it all. While Bogey could spend an hour talking about his Roberts teammates and how much fun they have as a team, the leadoff hitter, B.I., has been Roberts' leading hitter since the team inception and deserves a pat on the back. As we move west, past the great teams of Coors Light, Windy City, and others, we get the Sin City of Las Vegas. The city is hot and so are the hitters. And it is sinful what sluggers like Steve Imlay do to a softball. This summer, Steve won the SPA Nationals Charity Home Run Contest with Einstein, finishing second. The Stone Man, Steve Stone, now 60 as well. Just doesn't seem like he swings hard enough. But don't tell him that. We wouldn't want to see this calm guy get riled up. We also see guys like Steve Hurd, Joe Lisak blasting away, and finally, the smooth groove swing of Mike Kelly. One of the most successful franchises is the Old A's from California. By now, probably over 50 national and world titles. They play in the 60s division and are a legendary senior team. 
I never played sports when I was a young guy, so I didn't get hurt when I was young. So I'm pretty healthy now, just a little overweight, but that helps. You gotta have a belly to hit the home runs anyway, so. I'm considered a power hitter. I don't consider myself a power hitter. I consider myself an on-base hitter. This is my 15th year in senior softball and 47th year playing slow pitch softball. I, uh, one thing I forgot to tell you, that the three of us are in the Senior Softball Hall of Fame. Uh, we've been playing with the old A's now for about seven, eight years. We've won over 40 national championships, the three of us playing together. I think we're going to be around a while. <laughs> we've proven it, that you can go on and on in this game. There are right now over six 80 and over teams. We're looking forward to that, aren't we, guys? Yes. Absolutely. All right. We want you, seniors. <laughs> One of Bogey's favorite hitters and an advisory member is Larry Campbell from Sacramento, California. Now 75, Larry still has an incredible amount of power, fluid mechanics, and to listen to his enthusiasm is inspiring. Back behind head. Ah, boom! The bat doesn't look like it's going very fast on film, but it's all I got. There's an old guy getting... More power, more bat speed. Ba, boom! Get your bat back behind your neck more, Larry. Okay. Hey! He got me! <laughs> your bat's not back behind your neck. That's right. Get it back there. No, it's not back. Oh, well, it's working, honey. Okay. That's nine. Two, two out, three over the fence with this bat. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I like it, love it. <laughs> Two of the yeah. older hitters that live near Larry are 89-year-old Denny go. Watson and 81-year-old speedster Joe Sugimoto. These guys absolutely rock and make Larry feel like a youngster around them. How much do you weigh? 127. Five foot five, 127. Uh, you think there's any chance for a tall, fat man to make it to uh, 89? Yeah. Get, get rid of the gut. <laughs> why do you still? Keep, why are you still playing softball? Because I like it. It keeps me in shape. I like the competition. <laughs> what else? Would you rather sit home with a recliner? Okay. Go. Oh no, oh no, I can't sit there too long. <laughs> I gotta be doing something. Hey, do something exciting. So why are you still playing softball? Well, I, <coughs> I enjoy the company and uh, it's nice to get back playing uh, softball. I just played uh, hardball a long time. And, hardball? Uh, and, uh, it uh, keeps me in shape and <laughs> active. Nationally, former super major players like Ron Parnell play for Seacrest with MTC and Hedricks fielding incredible teams. They are the best in the nation. And now, our grand finale. We travel up the outskirts of Seattle, Washington and the town of Kent. The amazing Russell Road Complex and the unreachable roof of the Edge of the Field Cafe. Hitting and hosting the event is Art Bash Eversoul. We have five seniors from 53 to 71 that we think can reach the side of the ice rink, 360 to 390 feet away. If someone goes off, perhaps the cafe will be in danger. 360 feet away and 25 feet high to reach the roof, 35 feet up from 360 to 420 feet away will take a super human effort and no one has ever cleared the peak of the roof 50 feet up and 450 to 500 feet away. Pitching will be SS USA World Champion Jimmy Downs and actor and athlete Bud Turner. The Cheesecake Girls, Heather and Karen, will be doing what Art hired them for, shagging. In front of local TV cameras, a crowd numbering in single digits, plus the millions viewing on DVD, let's see what these guys can do. These five men fairly represent power that is indicative of a good major, major plus senior hitter for their respective 60s and 70s age groups. Bogey picked them from the entire nation to represent the North Star flag, and they surely did not disappoint. 
Let's visit with them for a moment before the bombs start flying. Do you have a nickname at all, Tom? Yeah, Big Bird. I got married very early. Um, I'm a uh, great-grandfather. Now I'm very proud of it and have another one on the way. This is truly a game that you can play forever. Not only in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, but I'm telling you this, I'm looking forward to playing when I'm 90 someday. Primarily was I was a high school, all state, all city uh, baseball player for Cleveland High School right here in the area. And then uh, off to the Vietnam War, and when I got back, I got introduced to fast pitch. And I played for uh, a couple of the uh, top teams in the country, uh, the Peterbilt uh, team and uh, a Pan Pack uh, team. And we had many, many national championships. And I played from about 1968 to 1984, and then I was just a little too old for fast pitch, so I retired. 2002, I got a call from a buddy I used to play fast pitch was, uh, with, and he said, hey, guess what? There's a senior softball thing out there. I said, well, slow pitch, uh, that's for sissies. Well, how wrong I was. And I've been playing uh, the senior slow pitch now for about five years. And the whole time I've been trying to perfect my swing. I've worked hard all my life. I've been a school teacher, but I've always done things on the side that have been uh, physical labor. I love to do carpentry. Uh, I love to do uh, landscaping. So uh, I keep myself physically fit by continuing to work. And uh, a lot of the guys that are in their 50s and 60s call me dad. And if you're talking about being so active that you're going to wear your body out, I don't think that's true. I think you'll probably rust before you'll wear your body out if you're not active. One uh, piece of advice I could give a 25-year-old is to uh, be consistent with your workouts. Don't slack off, continue it, and you'll find that your body will respond. The older you get, the harder it is to get back in shape, so if you don't let yourself get out of shape, you're going to find out it's really beneficial to anything that you want to do. Not only in other things, not only in sports, but in other things too. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Rinaldi from California. I play with the California Old Age 16 over Major Plus National Champions. Great guys, great team. I don't have a number, I got a formula. My people are from a Sicily, and you pitchers out there, you don't throw Joe, you strike one phone call away. <laughs> oh, Tommy! Awesome, oh, yeah. awesome, Tommy! Oh. Show me what you got. Awesome! Well, you're not that far from getting that thing out of here. As, when the ball comes off the bat, see, I just, there we go. I just watch my high. Right here. Look at this.
man, that would have been a nice. That, that would have been close. Yep. Those guys were incredible, weren't they? And we thought that by watching them, some of you young guys might be inspired enough to continue to hang with the game and try to get over that hump of improvement. Although we really appreciate the catalog and retailers that have sold our products in the past, we're releasing this at a $10 price, understanding that it's an age of piracy and people are copying things all the time. So we're trying to make it easier for you to buy the original with a nice jacket and the original quality on it than to go out and have to get a pirated copy of something and make it affordable and make it a three and a half hour value that you're gonna appreciate and something to use over and over. First off, there's a full-fledged internet softball retailer called softballfans.com. It has one of the largest softball forums nationally, ranging from open talk to training. There's over 20 forum topics, including user bat reviews and manufacturers forums. It's the biggest wealth of information and softball talk nationally. Kelly's Ultimate Sports, a web and store based retailer, pioneered bat reviews by videotaping them and then hosting them on YouTube. Rally Time Sports also offers bat reviews from Big Vic, a respected softball player and retailer. But the ultimate in bat reviewing is Bat Wars, sponsored regionally around the US by Softball Magazine. All the top new bats are there for you to hit on a fence field, and you can judge the bats for yourself. So go to softballmagazine.com for full details. I like to see the pros hit, and you can go to YouTube to see them, or Softball 360 hosts a lot of hitting clips from the Long Haul Bombers Tour. Johnny McCraw and Brett Helmer are past champs, and a lot of the guys you see on this DVD are currently on the tour or have been on the tour. BigCat844.com is Mike Basenko's website with softball history, training, and hitting tips, and tons, tons more. Bat Militia is also a retailer which hosts videos that you can send in, and this can also be linked from Mike's front page on W. Instructional videos that I have seen and enjoyed were Mike Masenko's video, sold off his website, Rusty Bumgarner's Pure Power, and more recently I bought Bob Waldyke's Powerful Hitting Secrets. These guys present hitting in an interesting manner. They're great hitters and I enjoyed watching them. Videos that I have not seen but are popular are Batspeed.com, English B, and for softball, Todd Graham has a couple DVDs, Swing Mechanics 1 and 2, and he enjoys a loyal following. Again, I haven't personally watched these videos, but I think with a good understanding of the mechanics, you can watch any outside source, and you can decide what to pick or choose and what makes sense to you out of them. Scott Kirby's family is involved in Softball Kingdom, and they do a great job of streaming live a lot of the pro events and some of the upper-level softball. They also have forums on there, great place to go. The old scout has been a standard for many years since Jerome Ernest and Gordy does a good job 
promoting their pro game and, and it's a lively form of discussion and gossip on those forums. And the classic softball spring training is held every year in Jacksonville and it's hosted by Kurt Hollis. And they too have a website and they have a great three or four days of fun down there in Jacksonville every spring. On our website at sportstechnique.com we offer two baseball and three other softball DVDs and we price everything at $10 anymore plus shipping. I want to thank my wife, Mary, and my son, Brett, for all the patience and work they've put into this project. Consultants Jim Ramsey and Roger Doc Clay have helped over the past four or five years on this as well. I got some advisory help from Dan Reed, Rusty Houston, my buddy Larry Campbell. In the inner circle of staff on this project was Art Eversole, Paul Sicey, Steve Imlay, Phil Mazio, Dave North, and Brett Van Bogart. They offered a ton of input on this video as they worked on their swings. I want to really thank Destiny Glasson, who is a college fast pitch girl who is helping us with that program. She had a major flaw in her swing. And we found a lot of the drills that we used in fast pitch had a great crossover into the slow pitch. And she did a tremendous job of, of demonstrating those for us. And I want to thank her for that time. I also want to thank the other fast pitch girls like Allison Taylor, Jamie, Lindsay, T and Brooke. Girls that helped with that program that has crossed over and helped us teach better in the slow pitch world. Another thing I want to mention is you can see the pros can have a bad swing and we showed many flawed swings oh, in both Brett and I. I hope that anyone who has a swing flaw shown here will understand that these shots will help others better understand how to fix their swings. I also want to thank my senior manager for Roberts, Dave Ducolo, for his help in some late appraisals of this project and for his unselfish work as player manager of Roberts Construction. Duke exemplifies the senior athlete. A year ago, he had a new artificial knee, and last week he just got done batting 800 in the Senior Western Nationals. On a personal note, I can't thank Softball Magazine enough for all they've done for us. Uh, Gene Luan, the rest of the staff, Boomy for making an appearance, Bob Gray, everyone involved with it. Danny and the photographers are incredible over there, and Mike and the rest of the support crew are really awesome. Softball Magazine Spring Training gave us the ability to go down and work on our game, and it also gave us access to the pros that you see in this video. They have a tremendous magazine. It's beautiful. The photography is incredible. The writing is good. All the pros are featured in there. You can go to Bat Wars. They have a baseball, softball, and fast pitch that they're expanding into. The website's incredible. Go to the website. You'll find out all about it. And, and certainly try to make a point of going to Softball Magazine Spring Training. You're going to leave there with more in equipment than you paid for the entry fee. So absolutely awesome. Can't say enough about them. The SSUSA with Fran and Dave Dowell, uh, Terry, Bill and Susan Ruth, I thank them for providing the seniors with the venue and for giving us the opportunity to give you an inside look at that. Go to their website. They have a message board form. Absolutely awesome. And what they do for seniors is incredible. I want to thank Bob Russell and Evil Sports for supplying us with the 44, 375 balls we used throughout the video, and also for introducing and supplying us with some Evil BP balls. Those things are incredible. They have great performance, yet they're safe for composite bats. I want to thank Kevin Schulstrom and Mike Misenko, uh, working with Combat and Anaconda. They're awesome to work with, and I thank them for their work on the project and for helping us do some research, and for supplying us with a couple Mike Misenko Senior Gear bats to use as my demo. My teammate JR hit five home runs with uh, Mike Masenko in the national championship last year in Phoenix to help win the game for us. And been a very awesome bat and I'm glad that they were able to help us on the video. Mule Tech provided us with the mule balls, the power bag, and with the brush top tee. That stuff is absolutely cutting edge awesome. Have a ton of stuff listed on the site. We thank them for their involvement. Want to thank Pitch Safe. Pat Beidelman is a great senior player, lives down in Florida. He invented this product, he made it himself, and it makes it easy to practice with a measure of safety. Finally on the sponsor end, Tenel supplied Brett and I each with a couple pairs of shoes to use in the production of the tape in this DVD. And I gotta tell you, I have wide feet. They're like triple Fs and they're 13 inches long and my feet are always coming over to the side of the shoes. And these shoes here provide so much stability on the side that they're just awesome. They have the patented cleat design on the bottom that saves your knees and hips, and you won't find a better shoe. This has the best balance of quality, comfort, and safety offered in the shoe market today. And Tim and Chad were generous enough to provide a 20% off coupon code on our DVD cover, so just call in in the line of this discount for whatever you want to buy there. I want to thank Art Eversole and Diane for hosting the Senior Bomb Squad in Seattle, Mike Kelly for hosting us in Las Vegas, and to Dave North, and the Woodlawn Hitting Club for hosting the Winter Training Center of SportsTechnique.com. I'd like to acknowledge some of the major pro manufacturers you've seen in this DVD. 
Sales reps for Combat Softball are Johnny McCraw and Jason Kendrick. Brett Helmer, of course, is a national rep for Easton Sports. Dennis Turner represents Worth Products. Corky Pelham, as you know him by now, is the man you see at the Mike and Truck, and he works with Mike and on a national level. Larry Carter has been a DeMarini spokesman for many years, and Kevin and Mike sell the senior gear in the combat line, as well as a U-Trip Larry Carter legend bat. Sometimes the first impressions you make on people aren't always the best. Kevin and Mike and I were hitting in Phoenix, and John Stote, the president of Anaconda, came out to hit with us, and he was fielding the left field when I took my turn at bat, and I uh, had to catch a one hopper that bounced and nailed him pretty good. And... Oh, shit. Oh! Sorry about that. He is. Ken made some impression on me. Look at the impression Ken made on me. <laughs> right here. Is that something else? But being a former college basketball jock, I never did hear back from the Rock's lawyers, and uh, I think we're all cool now. This project has been a lot of work, but it's also been a lot of fun. And we want to thank everyone who's been involved for making a quality product, and we're proud to have been part of it. <clears throat> that you already swing real fast. Now I take the lead arm and the top arm, and I put them together and take my normal swing with soft tops. Well, yeah, but it, I didn't think it hit the board and take the light out. About like this, Bear. The wider you can get, how wide are your feet? How wide are they? Yeah. I have triple E. Oh, yeah. Now, you, you say you're tight. Uh, you look pretty good with the shirt off, I assume. Yeah, I look real good with the shirt <laughs> off. And you'll never see that again, Mr. Bogart. <laughs> also, I'm selling my new lino tail on it. Sean, what do I think of that? What could be added to that? Well, this one must be they, quite old, don't you think? They're very old. This one they call pressure. I believe they're playing cricket. No, that's my line. Oh. Two, one, two, Oh, my goodness. What a mess. That this was bad. Whoops, my bad. Hey, Crusher, you better down it down a little bit, okay? Bogey, I think you were in a little early. Anything else you want to add for uh, Easton? Easton plug. Yeah, I'm happy to be rid of Jeff Wallace. I don't, we're really not, you know, seeing eye to eye. He's staring at me through the dugout, accusing me of being on steroids. I don't really appreciate that. I am a big Dennis Turner fan, though. I'd like to get that on air. <laughs> I figured I'd better walk over here too before you start saying something bad about me. The 40 pounds overweight that threw me off with the steroids. Thing. Which one of us? <laughs> I mean, if you warm up the stuff, <laughs> I hope you got that. I hope that wasn't on there. Here, sir. I didn't sign any papers to be in the video. He's talking to rebuttal from me, okay? Jim, from you. What's the name of this DVD? Analyzing and correcting swing flaws. Analyzing and correcting swing flaws has changed my life. Hey, <laughs> 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 North Star. North Star. We have to sign a release for that. Who'd you pick? Chris. 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 Oh, you look low. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Something nice for the kitties, huh? For YouTube, huh? <laughs> Guys. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah.